Hi friends, good evening and uh, this is your host Ankit Kanelwal joining you from Delhi, India and uh, uh, we have uh, Nick Palavita joining us from Delhi, North Carolina. Good morning to the world and welcome to uh, IBM TV Startups Wednesday and I hope uh, Nick, uh, today we have a lot of startups showing up uh, to start the show but uh, I right here. There we go. Well, yeah, we got Startup Wednesday coming on from IBM TV. And uh, just a couple announcements for people that are have been following IBM TV last night. We had, and well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I learned that from our uh, Washington, D.C. correspondent yeah. who's going to be joining us because he always says that. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, which is true on IBM TV. Depending on where you're at in the world depends on what time of day it is in the world so it d differs from from where you're at but yes we do have an exciting line it line up uh today um we're also going to be a but you know, kim, yeah kim you know uh, nick uh, we have a special guest today on the board and uh, oh i, I know i saw that will be, everyone will be amazed uh, to have uh so i think uh, jim also would be excited so as mark and other people oh, so, so you want me to bring in our guest our, before i start let, let, let's start with our uh, world news uh sorry uh, news uh, read by uh Bill, and then uh, we can invite. Uh, okay, let's get our, our Washington report in, and then we're going to go look. Yep. From IBM TV, international broadcast media, this is your report from Washington. The Republican con convention continued with its theme of God, country, and the American flag versus anarchy and socialism. Opening the evening with uplifting stories of African American achievement, Donald Trump issued a pardon for a three time felon who founded a not-for-profit to help transition former felons back into American society. The convention then showed a clip of Donald Trump handing out the diplomas to graduates of the school. At a separate point in the convention, we witnessed Donald Trump presiding over the naturalization ceremony of immigrants. After these warm and heartfelt moments, the Republicans returned to their withering attacks on Joe Biden and the Democrats. Headlined by Senator Rand Paul, uh, in the first indication of a potential foreign policy for a second term of the Trump administration, uh, Rand Paul indicated that the United States policy might be to pull out all U.S. forces from conflicts around the globe. It was not clear whether this would include U.S. forces in non-combat situations, however. Senator Paul also indicated that during a potential second term, Trump would end all foreign aid that the U.S. currently provides. Thereafter, the speakers continued their attacks on Joe Biden and the Democrats, stating that Joe Biden would plunge the economy into a recession and turn the country into socialism. The convention then pivoted to celebrating Trump and his handling of the economy, asserting that Trump built the economy once, pulling it out of recession, and that he could do it again. Finally, the Republicans continued their focus on outreach to African Americans, including Jacob Blake, the African American who was shot seven times in the back by a white police officer in Kenosha, Wisconsin, leaving him paralyzed from the waist down. The Republicans also reached out to suburban women arguing that Trump has a, a track record of delivering results for the American people during challenging times versus Joe Biden's 47-year failed record of far-left policies. Hmm. In other news, the FDA uh, commissioner admitted that he overstated the benefits of the convalescent plasma uh, during the administration's announcement this past weekend, but denied that his prior statements were the result of political pressure from the administration. Next, the Trump Organization, that is, the president's personal business, is the target of a criminal investigation into alleged financial misdealings by the New York State Attorney General's office. In our post office update, there has been no movement on the $25 billion emergency funding uh, measure passed by the House. It remains dead in the legislative process in the Senate. In addition, the comprehensive COVID-19 relief package remains untouched. It is unclear if it is on legislative life support or simply dead. It has been three months and counting. The current COVID death toll stands at approximately 178,000 Americans with no end in sight. 
Finally, a new poll indicates that approximately 96% of Americans have made up their minds about their selection in the presidential election this year. This indicates that this election will be, term be determined by the ground game of both parties. That is your report for this day, August 26, 2020, from IBM TV, International Broadcast Media, Smart TV for Smarter Global Community, from dictatorships to democracies around the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. I'm Bill Trezevant. Thank you. I just love that. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, everybody, depending on where you're at. And also, dictatorship to democracy, I think, uh, Bill, uh, is, uh, I mean, amazing uh, news reading. And, I, and also, see, the best part is that the people around the world are connecting with Bill, and uh, they're looking forward right. to these news. Uh, so that's something uh, which is interesting. And Kim is also watching uh, us right now. Uh, she had to go for an appointment, so she will be uh, joining us. Yeah. Uh, hey, he's, be he's, he's, he's better than Walter yeah. Conkright. Walter Conkright said, that's the way it is. And this guy goes, Definitely. good morning, good afternoon, good night. So maybe we should bring this guy on our show. Let's see if we can go find him. I'm looking through the internet. Oh, there he is. Hey, Bill. Good, good to see you here, right? You know, on IBM TV. Let's bring some more guests in. Oh, there, there's Jim. Uh, he's, he's arrived from the Socialist Republic of Silicon Valley. Our special guest. Special guest has arrived. JK. Good morning. Oh, wait, what city are you in? Good morning. Um, Monterey County, California. Monterey County, California. Okay, you're right next door to. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, there is a feedback. Uh, there is a lot of feedback from your end. Uh, can you check out your mic because there's a lot of feedback from your end? Yeah, see, I, I, it, it's from our end because I can tell because I turn it on and off. There, the feedback's gone, but that's because I'm muted. Yeah. Let's add Alexander Starr from Toronto. Sasha. Natasha, right. And we have one more person coming in, but uh, they're not on the stream yet. So let's go, go to JK because I want to listen to JK. Let's see if we can get it. We're still getting feedback. Okay. I don't know what that's about. Uh, you may have another computer. You know again, I think that would, uh, what, what is it? Demo, and oh. then... Uh, Log off, log off and back on is what Ankit's telling you. Yeah, and, and just make sure you go through this feed. Don't turn on don't turn on a cell phone and listen to us because yeah. uh, otherwise it'll get great feedback. It's you know, nice meeting you. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to leave the studio and then come back in? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And make, make sure you do not have your cell phone on. Not on. All right. There we go. Yeah. See, we, 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 we can solve these technology problems, right? You know, IBM TV, we're high tech. That's right. Every startup has these issues. Every startups have these issues. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah you can That's say what that. Startup Wednesday is all about uh, discussing the issues and how to solve those issues. But uh, before we start, I think uh, we have uh, something from Bill uh, about the RNC and what's going on the, in the today's news. Bill, over to you. Uh, yes. The uh, Well, actually, what I could not fit in the report uh, this morning is this, is that um, we are in the uh, combative season. Uh, while the RNC has been running what has now been commonly termed as the Trump family show, uh, which will continue uh, today, um, the Democratic Party has taken clips from day one of the RNC convention and turned it into an attack ad. I know, Jim, I, I know, I, I understand it's a lot. But um, it's interesting because now you're seeing the mobility of both parties. But the Republican Party seems committed to um, a scorched earth policy uh, towards the campaign. And on the one hand, it, uh, it, it is a stark difference between the two candidates. And so there's going to be a clear choice, whichever way the Americans decide to vote. Uh, we have our guest, Nick. Yes. Uh, yeah. JK has joined us. Now we can hear you, or at least you sound good. We don't have the feedback. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You're from Monterey, California. Um, what, what do you do? I'm a full-time mom, and I have a son uh, with some special needs, highly verbal autism. Um, and I'm a co-parent with uh, his father, who also identifies as being on the spectrum with the same. Uh-oh. 
Can you, oh, can and, you, can you move your uh, mic and then just uh, use it yes, without mic because better? it's not better. I mean, this is a lot of uh, disturbance. Yeah, can, mm -hmm. you, uh, can you unplug your mic and then try it out? Unplug it's the mic. Unplug. unplug the mic. Yes, it's unplugged. Is that better? I hear it fine. It's better, but, but this is not talking. I'm closer. Closer. Is this better? Sorry. Mm -hmm. I it's think better, so. but uh, there is a lot of feedback going on. So if you unplug the mic, I think that, that should work out. The problem is with the mic. So really? The mic? Okay. So the mic is in my computer. It's a Dell. I don't have another mic. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, well, can, we can hear you. There's feedback. There's a lot of background noise. A lot of noise. feedback and all this stuff here. Um, are, are you using Chrome browser or the Fire Which browser you are on right now? Computer. Let me um, let me figure this out. What I'll do is in the meantime, I'll, I'll connect uh, with the uh, team offline, and then we will start the show, and uh, we'll get this sorted. Yeah, it looks like we're getting a lot of feedback uh, yeah. on. And I'm I'm not not sure why that is, but um, it is. Whoa, where did where where did everybody where did Ankit go? <laughs> Ankit's been backstage working with her. Oh really? Oh, they're backstage working. Can they do hurry that? up, guys? <laughs> can, can 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 they actually do that? I didn't know that. Okay, so okay. for those who just joined us at IBM TV, we have Bill Trezevant, our Washington DC correspondent, who brings us and everybody around the world update real news on politics around the world. Because we just discovered, uh, Bill, by talking to our people in Australia, that they only get one feed. Believe it or not, in really? Australia they only get one feed. It's called Fox News. So everybody in Australia believes. Trump will win by a landslide. I am not kidding. <laughs> okay, that's not, so that's not entirely true, Nick. Uh, you <laughs> told me that the the main thing Sky Television is is Rupert Murdoch, which is oh, Rupert Murdoch. In other words, they only hear yeah. But Bill, they do I have know. other channels. They have other channels, but basically, Rupert Murdoch dominates the Australian airwaves. And yeah. I'm sitting here going, "Are you kidding me?" So IBM TV is is basically disrupting the international community by actually showing what goes on in the United States because these other people around the world really don't hear it right. But remember, this has been my big beef media even here in this country. Five stations control 90% of our media. It used to be 50 court companies controlled 90%. So uh, every time I listen to television, I listen to it totally different. There are agendas going on on every channel. I mean, it's just awful. And so the thing is, um, and plus the programming is horrible. I mean, how many times can you watch Survivor? I mean, Lord, you know, uh, it's just absolutely horrible. So that's the advantage of IBM TV that uh, we're going to do that. Now, we're also going to be sponsoring World Peace Day. First of all, I didn't know World Peace Day existed. So I was talking to the sponsor. I'm going, what's that? You know, but on uh, apparently this has been going on for decades. I've yeah. been asleep you know, doing business, but uh, it start, it's on uh, September 21st, the whole day we're going to get our programs behind World Peace Day. It's something that I don't think is controversial, but it could be because, you know, we're going to promote world peace and then we're going to listen to people say, no, that's not right. We should all be fighting each other. So uh, we, we, what you need to do is find people that are pro-war. Um, I'm sure they're out there uh, throughout the world and we'll have to find them so they can show the other side to the argument why we should all always be at war as opposed to being at peace. But I think it'll be a very interesting day. That's September 21st. Uh, and so anyway, Bill Trezvan, our Washington, D.C. correspondent, our, our resident socialist from Silicon Valley, Jim Ede with the Ede Foundation, you know, and of course, this we learned from our friends in Indian, nam namaste, that means don't touch because otherwise you spread the coronavirus. Right. And he's also the famous author of Chess for Dummies with over one million copies sold. Shameless self-promoter he is. <laughs> <laughs> he rips out the book. Uh, the Sharif School of Economics is on from Malaysia. Sharif, welcome to the show. I can always figure out what time it is because I know you're at a 12-hour distance. It's 10.15 p.m. Why it's 10.15 a.m. here. So um, I, I, can, yes. I, I can do Malaysia conversions now. It's just a complete 12 <laughs> hour difference, you know? And then, yes. and then from Toronto, Canada, and also our friends from Russia who helped organizing um, our mainstream Russian contingents is um, Alexander Starr, who also runs uh, investments Wednesday, today, right? Uh, you have, one o'clock. 
one o'clock Eastern time, investing with Sasha. I have a couple other people I want to send to you, Sasha, that are that are individual investors besides Peter Bennett, who you just met. Uh, but there's another one, Walter Cherapensky, who runs Walter Football, also does individual investing. So I'm going to send them over to you and um, see what you want sure. to do. But I, I believe you and Shaquille, the professional investor, are going head to head right now, right, on uh, your investing show? If he will show up. Oh, if he'll show up, right? Okay. Well, I have a couple <laughs> other people sure that will show up. Yeah, Jim's going to referee that one. Well, well, the thing is, here's what I find interesting. I know this is a little bit of a side, but the Dow just threw out Exxon Mobil. I mean, yeah. can you? Yes, can you imagine that Exxon Mobil, which is a big company? Yeah. I yeah. mean, huge. It's one of the biggest companies in the world. Yeah. The Dow goes, you're not performing, so out, they're gone. Wow. Seriously, they're no they longer want to see green numbers. They want to see big numbers going upwards. Well, one way to do it is to change the goalpost or the metrics. Right. Yeah. Go. 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 Look at this, Sharif. They kicked out Exxon Mobil from the Dow uh, component. So when you look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, forget about Exxon. And they brought in Salesforce.com. Hopefully, you see more green than red. Salesforce.com, which is a good CRM platform, but are you serious? Really? You, you know, out Salesforce in? in? I, I just threw up. I'm sorry. And that you know, else they threw out Pfizer. Can you believe that? Pfizer has really? been, yeah, I know, really. Uh, Pfizer has been a component of the Dow for years. It's a big pharmaceutical company worldwide. Just got tossed like, like they're a worthless piece of trash out of the Dow Jones Industrial Averages components. And I was going, so who'd they replace them with? Honeywell. Well, Honeywell's doing better. So they brought in Honeywell. I was going, are you kidding me? But so, have you seen what's happened today with a Salesforce? No, Just what happened? Take a look. Take a look what's happened with the Salesforce today. Yeah. The stock went up almost instantly, about 25%. Yeah, of course. It never happened before. Yeah. It's inverse. It, 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 hey, you know what, what it is? It's a client, um, what do I call it? Client relationship management software, which That's my right. friend, which my friend, um, 57 points, Sasha. Okay. Well, my friend, uh, who's, who's the guy, Alan Treffler, actually runs a competitive CRM called uh, Pegasystems. I haven't checked the Pegasystems stock yet. I, I know we're digressing here, but the thing is, this, this is just unbelievable what just happened. But Pegasystems, I wonder what they're trading at right now. Can Pegasus somebody give six? They're up six at 130. They, they they went up six points at one thirty. Okay, All right, because they're CRM software too. But come on, I mean, who 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 controls this thing? I'm sorry, Exxon Mobil is huge. To toss them, you have to be an idiot. Okay, who runs the Dow? Yes, what do we have, Bill? Well, no, I have a question for uh, Sharif and Sasha. I mean, isn't that uh, essentially, you know, Nick? You said move the goalposts, but isn't that essentially um, skewing? Uh, the Dow, because you're thinking, I mean, Exxon's having a bad time because, sure. uh, you know, the uh, decrease in demand. But isn't that really, uh, I, I think another panelist the day before had talked about the disconnect between the economy and the stock market. Isn't that further exacerbating the issue such that um, uh, America just won't know, further confusing the economic system? Absolutely. I mean, the thing is, there's absolutely no question. It is, it is a... It, it's a game changer. In other words, if you don't like how the Dow's performing or you want to perform better, grab a stock that's performing better and get rid of the ones that isn't. And then the, the world will not, not know because the market keeps going up. And why does it keep going up? Because you keep changing the goalposts. It's, in a lot of cases, it would be just considered cheating. Well, Sasha, is this, is this part of the Saving Private Donald? Saving um, Private Donald. Okay. Saving Are Private Donald is uh, intact and it's, uh, it doesn't disappear anywhere. However, speaking about Dow, um, Dow really lost its relevance. It's everyone, professional investor follows S&P 500. Right. So S&P 500 is much more representative of really what's happening with the stock market rather than Dow. So Dow is almost uh, people who don't invest when people talk on a cocktail parties, if there are any held these days, 
We're not talking about DA because that's all what they know. Very few people even know what is S and P five hundred. So people talk about DA, but DA really is relevant. So Salesforce is going up today as crazy. What twenty five percent, or maybe it will go seven hundred percent. It could go to uh, ten thousand percent in the near future. But it's not because it's a Dow stock. Absolutely not. And Dow has a lot of garbage, like Walgreen. What is Walgreen doing in Dow? It's a horrible company, very inefficiently run. Uh, any money what they still have, they're paying as dividends to to say investors. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, we know that we are lousy. But stay on, stay on. Things will change or whatever. They're paying almost four percent dividend. How much dividends pay Salesforce? Probably none. <laughs> and Walgreen pays four percent. That's a that's a crime. That's all what it is. So if people want to invest in Dow, where it's only certain stocks, and one of them is Walgreen, so you already have one garbage stock in order to. Put in 29 other stocks, you must buy this garbage. Now, if we will go a little bit further, you'll find a little bit more garbage than just Walgreen. But the Walgreen is so obvious <laughs> that I just wanted to make it as an example. So, um, of course, it's SP. But even SP is not representative of what's going on. I did a couple of trades today in the morning and uh, the trading is so easy that I, I'm wondering why why people are um, going uh, to hold the jobs, spending their time and money on universities and everything else, but their money is just there. <laughs> and instead, people are torturing themselves through all their lives. Oh my God, what a crime. What a, uh, what a calamity, I mean. <laughs> Edible. Think about this. I have 500, just as an example, I have 500 shares of Microsoft. I wish I would have 5,000, but no, I have 500 shares. Sasha, so, I think uh, for, uh, we can talk about stocks on your show. I, uh, we should go to our uh, special guest today. Uh, so, I Kim, uh, I think uh, it's sounding better now. Oh, good. Sorry okay, about that. Excellent. Okay, can you? <laughs> So can, you us, uh, Welcome. Can, you, can, you, can you tell us about yourself to our viewers, what you do, where are you from, and uh, yes, of course. Uh, how you are surviving during the COVID situation? Um, I didn't hear the last part. COVID. Uh, how, how are you doing okay. with COVID? But first, give us your mm -hmm. background. So, as I was saying, I'm sorry. Thank you for your patience. Of course. Um, this is new for me. I'm a single mom, and my son... Um, is gifted twice exceptional and i co-parent with his dad um, in monterey county um, who also identifies as being on the spectrum which includes adhd and autism and in my spare time i um, have a training well i have a background as a therapist so i'm building my practice now that i he's older now um, 13 years old and um, I'm an advocate, not only for him, but for other families in the special education system. And um, during COVID, um, it's been a land of opportunity because there are so many risks and um, the COVID sickness is rampant with regards to mental health and wellness. So it's been a great opportunity for me to help support uh, friends and community during this time. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you, you are based out of uh, which city? So um, we're in Monterey County, California. California. Wow. Right. Which is south and, of uh, Silicon Valley. Yeah. Silicon Valley, everyone knows about it. And Silicon Valley is more popular than uh, San Francisco or uh, California, especially in India. And I think people would agree with me. But Monterey is a destination. So people go to Monterey for many reasons. It, so really? it's also famous in its own right. It's kind Is of a it, uh, secret. North or south? South. South. Okay. South. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, you, you know, and the thing is, special needs is an area that's not addressed very often, doesn't have very many advocates. We had um, Brett Horton on this last Friday on IBM TV, who's a specialist on special needs. I saw and we were dis- yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were discussing that because what the one problem they have, JK, is that uh, there's no voice. In other words, for special needs and mental health in general. I uh, also did have a request for us to get a mental health specialist on, but even finding them is difficult. But uh, no, no, no. Uh, we, we, we need somebody who's a specialist who can help cure people. Oh, not, okay. Not, not a person who has tremendous problems like you, Jim. We yes. need somebody okay. who can solve the problem. I misunderstood you know? it. Yes. Okay, yes, I, I, I totally understand that you, you misunderstand. But certainly um, <laughs> we, we could do uh, is we could actually put a show together for that, for a special uh, health, special needs and mental health issues, okay? Because it's not addressed on major television. In other words, uh, as I go around major television, they just ignore the subject altogether. What we like to talk about, at least in the United States, is race and sex. I mean, that, that leads every day. I'm going like, well, Lord. Okay, but mental health and um, special needs, no, nah, we're not going to listen. Yeah. We, we'll put that, put that in the background. Yet, there's a huge population that's affected by mental health issues and special needs issues, and they just get no love whatsoever. So, Anka, we got to put that on our drawing boards. In addition yeah. to, we are sponsoring the World Peace Day, which I didn't even know existed. I got, I've been slapped around for that one. But I didn't um, know Frank Zappa existed. So I don't on. even know. I, I, I honestly, even today, I don't know who Frank Zappa is. I'm going to have to go Google him. I live in my own world. I know who chess players are, by the way. Okay, well, I'll have to Google Frank Zappa. I guess he's important. Uh, what's his chess rating anyway, Jim? Well, uh, Frank Frank Zapp is one of those people who doesn't play chess. Who I still okay? Don't then, know. then then he doesn't exist. He doesn't exist in my world if he doesn't play chess. I don't care who he is anymore. You know, but but the thing is, special needs and mental health issues. We're doing World Peace Day on uh, September twenty first, and we're going to devote a whole day of programming for World Peace, and uh, hopefully get our producers to, including Sharif. I don't know how you do the economics, Sharif's economics, and discussing World Peace at the same time, but you know, you got to move your your economics handle. toward world peace. We can handle it. Can we handle it? Kim, so I, I'd I like to want say... to ask you a question. Oh, um, yes. Uh, yeah. uh, did, you talked about a spectrum of mm-hmm. autism, and uh, I had a next-door neighbor who had Asperger's. Yes. And is that considered on the same spectrum as autism? Or... Yes. So okay. Asperger's is a controversial term. It was from Hans Asperger's in Austria who actually saved a bunch of his clients at that time uh, from the Nazis. And so because of that um, history, it's complicated. Um, Some people here, although I don't think he was a Nazi sympathizer, he was actually quite the opposite, in my opinion, um, who have, um, who identifies being on the spectrum, they, are offended by the term Asperger's. So it's politicized where it kind of goes in fads, in and out. Really what you're talking about is highly verbal autism, which um, has some challenges and some benefits as opposed to nonverbal or, um, uh, there's another term, sorry. Um, uh, sorry, I need breakfast. <laughs> but nonverbal <laughs> I hear, autism. I hear that. Um, so, the spectrum is quite broad and actually there's a lot of us can identify as being on the spectrum in some way or another it's stigmatized because people aren't really educated around it so we need to be part of the social change movement to change our consciousness and awareness about it because to be frank um the most highly gifted people and the people who are the change makers in our world and historically are on the spectrum, okay? Because they're highly gifted and specialized. And so we're actually um, looking for this trait in our genetics. Um, and um, according to Darwinian theory, we're actually um, creating more people with this trait globally. So we live in the virtual age and these particular traits for people on the spectrum that they're highly specialized in are going to be more significant and important important to our world. One thing that I wanted to say also is that it's completely related to economics. And so that's part of my mission 
to um, do some research with regards to helping the social change movement, providing access to services and awareness around mental health and special needs. Um, because to be frank, again, uh, we can all identify with challenges in our uniqueness and we need to um, support bio biodiversity in terms of our brain wiring, right? Um, we all have uniqueness and unique challenges and strengths. So if we can look at that and also change the environments to be more friendly in terms of supporting diversity in every way, then we'll all be better off. I think so too. Hey, we have an advocate. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I like that. But but see, that this actually fits the wheelhouse of what we're trying to accomplish it. IBM TV is actually to serve underserved communities that just get, get no voice in mainstream media. But problem that we, we discovered by looking at the analytics of mainstream media in the United States, not India, not, not what ANKIT does, but over here is that there are it used to be we had 50 companies, five zero companies that had 90% of the media so that you could be on media. Today, there's five that control 90% of all the media in the United States. And if you're not catering to these five, out the door you go and they only look at two metrics, ratings, money. Okay, that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if there's no money and special needs and there's no big ratings and special needs, you can forget special needs. So I want to actually challenge that because people are spending a lot of money on special education privately because it's not funded at the federal level the way it should be. It's only funded at, is it 60% or 40%? So in terms of yeah. public education, um, parents, and even in private education, we're all funding and pouring in millions of dollars per family in some cases into special education. Yeah. Same with healthcare, okay? So in terms of not paying taxes in America, we're subsidizing this ourselves privately instead of leveraging collective, you know, monies. And the same thing is true for media. Instead of depending on, uh, you know, specific for-profit models, we should really look at uh, for community models, right? Which is what you're mm -hmm. doing and yes. what you've invested in. Thank you so much yeah, for your yeah. work. We're, we're, we're a not-for-profit organization. And the thing is, our goal is to serve under served communities. And uh, as we identify them, like what you're talking about, special needs, mental health issues. And, you know, some of that's being totally ignored, not just in the United States, but worldwide. You can obviously see somebody, and I know Jim loves Bobby Fisher, but Bobby Fisher obviously empirically suffered from schizophrenia and they just ignored it. In other words, um, it was never an issue, never even brought up by the mainstream media, but it was Didn't pretty, know pretty how to diagnose it at the time. No. Yeah, yeah, right. So I mean, schizophrenia is actually a catch-all term. Um, yes. And so I want to be careful about using that particular right. term. Um, right. And he may have had complex twice exceptional issues, which just refers to being gifted as well as having other challenges because the gifted myth is that that gifted person is perfect. We right. all have challenges and strengths. We need to leverage those. Yes, and then they, they've also done studies that, uh, and we have, um, we're, we're going to start a show. We have the Genius of the Year, who won the Genius of the Year award in 2017, start a show on high IQ people. But one, one thing that you find it very interesting about high IQ, there's a high correlation between that and mental illness. And I've talked to a lot of the societies. They think, oh, well, they have a high IQ, then everything's yes. good for them. And that's not true. Okay. Yeah, and I'd like to change the paradigm. Um, so can we um, shift positively in terms of talking about mental health? Because I think that's part of the stigmatization and re-stigmatization. If we can stop reifying mental health as a negative rather than a positive, mm -hmm. um, we can all you know, work for the betterment of our society and cultures because yeah. mental wellness is really important for each one of us. It shouldn't be stigmatized um, in any way, shape or form. We all have some mental health issues to some degree or another because that's part of introspection and development and maturation. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Ken, I, I would we also will. like to ask you because um, I agree with everything that you've been saying, um, but you were talking about the nonverbal uh, challenges. Uh, also, I, in my experience, it's also been eye contact. And I was wondering if that was the other thing that you were trying to remember. Uh, because uh, of the tactile components, they don't like Inattentiveness. Inattentiveness. And uh, so there's a whole spectrum of things <laughs> that can be characterized with the spectrum or people on the spectrum because everybody is unique. And so this particular idiosyncrasies of each individual, that's why you know you meet one person on the spectrum, you meet one person on the spectrum. and the eye contact can be overstimulating just as right. um, for neurotypical people, 
um, or who identify as more neurotypical because we are all on the spectrum. Right. Um, screen time can be overstimulating for people who are more neurotypical, whereas for someone with ADHD or um, autism, it's actually calming. So that kind of biodiversity and neurocognitive diversity is really fascinating. And eye contact can be abusive, right, for people who are overly sensitized by visuals. Um, so we just want to be sensitive to that. Um, and we all have multi-sensory challenges sometimes, right. depending on our stress level, depending on our context, depending on our background and history and culture, it's very complex. So if we can just be more um, kind and gentle with ourselves and each other, that would be great. Thank you so much for saying that. Thank you. How did you educate yourself on this? So I um, have learned from my son and my dear ex. Um, and from other people on the spectrum. And really it's about um, becoming friends with people who are unlike me. Um, I am in a program for edu um, education. It's an educational doctorate at Bridges, um, which focuses on gifted and twice exceptional education. I'm currently suspended. <laughs> I just started this in the summer. And so it's a brand new program. What happened was that I thought it was a program for um, supporting people who are gifted and twice exceptional, but it's actually for people who are gifted and twice exceptional, which is wonderful. Um, so I'm looking at my options um, and I'm gonna continue my research. I have a master's in uh, psychotherapy and I'm a marriage family therapist anyway, so it's not like something I need um, to get a doctorate, but I just wanna continue my research and work in this field. And I just wanna also say that um, this is a shout out for doctors, for lawyers, for everybody who's educated and gifted, because a lot of us who are highly intelligent, even someone who doesn't have the status and, you know, you'll see them in your neighborhood or you'll be friends with them. They're highly intelligent and gifted. OK, um, and I just want to recognize that we are still learning about this emerging research in the spectrum. Um, and that is actually quite common and has always been common. One in ten. Um, you'll think of Albert Einstein, you know, quirky people. Um, we call them quirky. And if we're quirky too, um, that helps us understand cognitive neurodiversity and have the empathy. That's very well said and explained. Uh, but I have a question, uh, and I always ask this question to myself that uh, when we talk about special needs people, uh, and we, when we go to the, I mean, for any travel or any, any response or things like that, those world or those, uh, I mean, places are not friendly for the special needs people and why we don't have that infrastructure so that uh, we can have uh, those people also be a part of the same community. They can also, I mean, go out and, uh, I mean, behave like what we do. They can also enjoy all those things because I'm still, uh, I mean, uh, there are places in US where you have those, uh, those kind of infrastructure, uh, I mean, enabled, but uh, in India and in countries like Asian countries, we don't have any support for them. It's just so, that uh, we treat them as a special uh, need people, mm -hmm. and then uh, there's uh, there's an offer sympathy for them, and uh, that's how uh, and, and that's how they also believe that uh, they are just uh, here for uh, just I mean there's nothing they can do and all those stuff. So that's what so, I, I'm I'm always questioning myself that what I can do to help those community uh, bring together and how we can empower them, because I think yes. we can have much heroes from those communities around the world, and they are the smartest people I've ever seen. I've never because I know a couple of them, and they are amazing. But it's yes. just that we don't come out in, in, in the market. I don't know. We don't come out in the mainstream media. We don't yes. talk about that. Thank you. That's a huge challenge and need right now. And I want to say that in Mumbai, I know that there's a program actually that addresses this very thing. There are pocket yeah. programs. Um, so um, they may not be well known, but in some companies all over the world, um, we do have programs that support people with um you know uh cognitive neurodiversity or what is called um other challenges um i think a lot of people think about disabilities in terms of conspicuous challenges um yeah. and uh, there's a lot of fear and stigma around that and that's based on lack of education and empathy right um so i think if we can just become more cognizant of the fact that they have incredible gifts like you were saying um, in terms of like even Down syndrome, uh, that's a very complex population. And yeah. what is wonderful is that they have this huge heart. So their social gifts are astounding, their social intelligence. 
um, as opposed to people on the spectrum who may lack some of that social intelligence and have strengths in other ways. Um, so yeah, I just, although the conspicuous challenges are what we are um, more aware of, the inconspicuous challenges are actually equally, if not more important. So um, I welcome your conversation about that. And this is a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Oh, um, Jay, this is Mark. Um, you're a long time ago, a short time friend. We were on a couple of projects and everything together. So glad that you are here. And uh, by the way, Anka, she is a big time fan of a lot of our programs here on the show and is oftentimes watching us and checking us out. So she has become a big time fan of the IBM TV network. But all of that aside and everything, I recently met her through another friend's uh, platform and everything. And we got to become friends and I'm actually helping her with one of her projects, which will actually deal with this autism and special needs and things along those lines. But the question that I've got to ask um, JH is so many people in society um, deal, like you said, in the workforce, in the school with folks that are of special needs. What is your advice to how to um, engage with these people? Because a lot of times I think folks are oftentimes lost in what to do with that. Um, they're oftentimes lost in how to handle um, mm -hmm. the issues when they're talking to folks that are in that community, whether it's Downs, whether it's, as you just said, it's not a term that a lot of folks like, which is Asperger's or autism. But I was just wondering if you could uh, tell us uh, some ideas as to how people can address um, this when they are meeting these folks. So I'm a Zen student um, for the past 30 years that has informed my work in my life. And one of the things that I really focus on or try to is to begin with a beginner's mind. So that means the growth mindset, the positive mindset from psychology is really important in terms of being open to learning from everyone and um, listening. So that's the beginning. The second is to see what in the environment might help this individual because we're really focused on strength-based um, mitigating environmentally um, their um, uh, pedagogy. So if we can um, focus on their strengths and mitigate the challenges in the, envi in the environment by changing the environment, that will help all of us because adaptive environments are actually good for all universal design. Um, and so that translates to the work environment in terms of relationships interpersonally. I think a lot of it has to do with intrapersonal work, right? So yeah. once we create that dialectic within ourselves, realizing and learning about what is triggering within us and examining our feelings that arise when we interact with individuals who are different from us, that will inform our relationship that we can develop with people who are unlike us at first. So that seeming difference will become less apparent over time as we identify more with them and learn more about where they're coming from and what their strengths and challenges might be. Does that help? Yeah, that helps a lot. Okay. And another thing that I know that folks, and I know it's a very important part of your life and everything, because we've gotten to know each other over these last several weeks and everything is, could you talk to us about the importance of mental health and spiritual growth? Because I know that you are also a very spiritual person and you make that connection between the mental and the spiritual. And of course, we've got somebody here on our show that uh, is called Coach Kumar, and she talks a lot about that as well. But in our conversations, we've oftentimes talked about the connection between the mental, the physical, the spiritual, and what um, some people might call the emotional. But I was wondering if you could talk about that even in your own development and growth. Thank you for asking. So this is really fundamental to my life. Um, and the reason why is because my mother mm -hmm. um, became an Episcopalian through a missionary in Korea when she was growing up and then followed the Beatles to England. She was the Church of England Episcopalian. And my father, although he doesn't talk about it, he was raised Buddhist. So in Korea, where I'm from, um, South Korea and Seoul, um, it's a very historically Buddhist country that has become modern, modernized in terms of Christianity. So there's constantly a tension and a war where uh, Christians are putting temples on fire. So when I was sitting at a retreat in Seoul on the outskirts um, at an international Zen center, the smoke was rising during our meditation one morning. And because my dad used to smoke, you know, they were given free cigarettes um, during the Korean War as a child. So I'm sensitive to smoke 
and I couldn't take it. So then I realized like, okay, it's been a month and a half. Do I really need to do more of this retreat? <laughs> there were other things going on with that retreat, one of which was the guiding teacher, who's now the international guiding teacher, um, who's actually a Jubu, a Jewish Buddhist from Philadelphia. Um, he had significant mental health challenges. And in that particular school of Zen, the Korean Quantum Zen School, um, he was given a lot of authority. He actually tried to kill himself. He was bipolar right before my retreat. And he was in love with a Zen nun from Poland. Well, lo and behold, emotional and mental health are essential to everyone, including people who are spiritually developed, right? And if they don't address, if we don't address our mental well-being at the same time as our spiritual well-being, what's going to happen to our spiritual life? It doesn't matter how much you practice um, any form or discipline of um, religion. It's only going to, I guess, be bifurcated within your internal life if you don't address the holistic well-being right which includes mental and psychological well-being so i see this quite often um and you'll come across it in terms of cults you know in the extreme form um i just think that in terms of my own uh, life i found it really important to balance wellness as a whole that includes um and is, in compo is composed of things such as um spiritual life, my spiritual life, my emotional life, my psychological development, my physical health, my relational well-being in terms of interpersonal relationships, friendships, family life, you know, all of these things inform my well-being as a whole. Um, and I just want to encourage people who are in religions and devoted to religions, um, which is a beautiful thing, to just really keep in touch with, um, you know, feelings, because feelings inform our brain, our spirituality, our physical well-being, well-being, it's a synthesis of everything that we are. So if we can keep in touch with our feelings, that will help inform us and guide us in terms of where we want to go and where we are right now. Thanks a lot. That was some great advice that you gave and everything. I know one of the other things, and I just wanted to know your thoughts on this, because um, Anchor has brought this up a couple of times. There is definitely a lot of things going on in, in, in India revolving around um, youth suicides and things of that nature. So I just wanted if you could give us like some advice for folks that are dealing in that field as well, because it is something yes. that we've seen in um, Bollywood, we've seen in yes. other parts of society. So I just wanted if you could comment on that. And then I think Jim's got a question as well. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I'm actually very concerned about suicidality. And as someone who was a teenager once, who had a very complex and traumatic upbringing in some ways, um, I think that suicidality is quite common and developmentally, um, you know, normal um, for everyone who becomes a teenager at some point because it has to do with existential existentiality. So who are we? Why are we here? What is the purpose of our life? If we can answer those questions for ourselves, with which is a spiritual, emotional question, metaphysical question, then we can come through it. Unfortunately for some of us, um, there is a genetic biological component and epigenetics informs some of our behavior, right? There are triggers. So if there's too many stressors, such as in Bollywood, I would want to say that there's tremendous pressure in terms of sexuality, gender issues, misogyny, culturally, there's a lot of pressure in terms of traditional roles, traditional roles um, and um, age specific um, identities. So. I am very concerned about media and its development and how it affects young people, especially women. Um, and um, I think in terms of suicidality and genealogy, if we can support people before they get into um, high pressure situations, starting from early childhood and also the parenting really needs to be informed and focused on this, especially for people who are highly intelligent, because a lot of us use our brains too much. We overthink things instead of keeping in touch with our somatics, our body, our nervous system, our limbic system, our wellness starts from there. If we can really keep in mind this holistic balance of um, wellness, then we will be able to support each other better. Thanks. I'm going to turn it over to Jim. I think Jim got a question. And then I need Sharif and Bill to jump into the conversation as well, because we are a panel and a team. So I need them to jump in as well. Yes. So, But I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. And I was going, just going to direct my question to Sharif for that very reason, uh, because I could listen to Kim for hours. 
But um, I wanted to know, because Sharif's background is in academia, and he's also in business, and he's been, uh, he's born in, in Bangladesh, now lives in Malaysia. And I wanted his perspective about what does he see in this, in this particular area where he has been and is now? Uh, yes, uh, especially this, uh, as I strongly invo involved with academia, so I saw that special education and special need education is very much growing uh, uh, things, in, 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 even though if you focus on Malaysia first. Malaysia, actually, I saw that especially Chinese community, they also helping different schools and, um, and, 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 and they, have, uh, they have a very good infrastructure that the support and the professional teacher for special uh, uh, need students. Uh, so, so, so I want to say, yes, still there are a lot of opportunity because, example, I also have connections with the South Asia, like Bangladesh, India and Pakistan. I saw that uh, still uh, they have to grow a lot of their infrastructure. They have to develop their teacher, even the parents, uh, because uh, this, uh, this area is very much complicated and uh, there are many things to grow. Besides that, I know that uh, Bangladesh Prime Minister's uh, daughter, uh, I think her name is Putul, uh, she also uh, moving with the same things. She has also uh, special children and uh, she also trying to develop different schools, different policy and different kind of activities in Bangladesh uh, because of, because of you know, uh, we have a very small country and huge amount of population. Uh, this, this is another thing, but uh, I want to say that uh, something, especially when, when, when this kind of things come, because especially I do engage with many parents, because parents have to take a lot of responsibility, and sometimes they are very puzzled, and uh, sometimes they, are, uh, they have a lot of challenges, and they are also find out the solution. I think the global arena, uh, not only governments from a special country, of, uh, or example, few of the education institution, I think different international NGO, uh, different kind of global expert, and they have to do more focus on that particular point because uh, still I think there is uh, there, there are a lot of work we have to do. Uh, but what I see for Malaysian perspective, I saw that different uh, NGO, different uh, uh, foundation, even government trying to contribute for that. Bangladesh, Honorable Prime Minister daughter, I think her name is Putul. She is doing a very good job in Bangladesh uh, for developing this kind of institutions and supporting parents and the children. Uh, this, is, this is the thing they are, they are trying to develop in Bangladesh. Yeah. So I, I, I have a question for Kim. Uh, Kim, uh, do we have any, uh, I mean, on an organization at the world level which talks about uh, the special uh, needs uh, uh, people and citizens and uh, how we can help them uh, mm -hmm. to empower them? I mean, because uh, Today the startup Wednesday, and then I think a lot of our uh, special needs people also want some kind of help to start their own startup, mm -hmm. maybe. And now, now the best part is that you can work from home, and you don't have to go outside to work. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, the, the technology allows you to work from home, and uh, you are in a place uh, which is known as Silicon Valley, uh, the tech world, for uh, in our sense. Mm -hmm. And then they have all sorts of technology to work it out uh, the way. So how we can empower them yeah. to uh, start their own startup, and so... how we can collaborate with that organization? Yeah, I just pulled out a book as Sharif was talking because um, Satya Nadella is the CEO of Microsoft. Yeah. And he's my dear ex's uh, manager. Um, so I do think that um, his experience within his own family is significant and representative of many families globally as we go into this virtual age, right? So um, he has a child with special needs. And I think because of the genetic components, we're going to see this a lot more epigenetically. It's going to become much more, um, you know, just common in terms of our awareness, because right now we're quite uh, uneducated around special education and biodiversity, neurocognitive um, diversity. Um, CEOs, stakeholders, change makers, historically and now, all have some kind of, uh, unique gifts. If we can help support these unique gifts in an emotionally grounded and uh, executive functioning um, challenges um, supportive way, um, then we'll be able to actually maximize these talents and gifts from people who are on the spectrum or who have special needs. Um, you know, we can all identify with special needs in some way. There are just some extreme forms um, which 
are often represented in highly gifted and intelligent and capable people at the CEO level, at management level, um, who depend and rely on people who um, have those executive functioning skills to scaffold right their work. Um, because a lot of times people who are on the spectrum don't have those executive functioning skills. If we can help support them emotionally, um, which means that we need to identify what the emotions are and help frame what the um, un, uh, unverbalized communication is, make that very clear, logical, black and white for them, that will be significantly helpful right because a lot of times people who are in these positions of power don't understand things that aren't black and white they're very rigid in their thinking they need support and with the nuances so um you know people have strengths and challenges that are unique we can help provide support as well as inform the dialectic thanks that was a great uh, part of the uh, discussion and everything. One other thing that I was going to ask you and everything is I know that uh, just from our conversations that you are also a Tai Chi um, practitioner yes. as well as involved in some of the other mindfulness and meditation kind of things. Can you talk about how that's important as well to like folks mental growth and mental development and how you incorporate that into what you do? I know that Jim is, by the way, also into yoga and things of that nature. So I just wanted to find out if you could tell us how that's also important. Yes, thank you. And I don't want to hog up all the time because your panel is so esteemed and educated and knowledgeable. Just briefly, it was my... Um... No, actually, no, we're not. <laughs> You're very <laughs> humble. You're very humble. And that's why I didn't so admire me. about you. That's why we're um, quiet. Uh, so please. Well, thank you. Um, so it was my Tai Chi teacher in college at Brown who introduced me to Zen Buddhism. And she started as a yoga student in uh, China as a 16 year old. She just turned 80 in February. Um, and I wanna help her go online because she lives in New York City in a senior housing development. She's completely isolated. So I started with Tai Chi um, and Qigong and that led me to Zen through her. And um, because of my personal family background, I um, am very curious about all religions and I studied comparative religion at college um, with minors in visual arts and poetry. Um, so I think in terms of Tai Chi and wellness, um, it's a martial defensive art um, and it's all about energy. So Qigong, Tai Chi, any kind of wellness form is all focused on energy, right? So if we can focus this energetic uh, wellness um, and broadcast it in terms of our overall well-being holistically, um, we can function better, right? And we can help the world more. So that's where I come from. And it's all based on what is your purpose? What's your intention in this life? Thanks. I appreciate that. By the way, I see that we've got uh, as well. Sorry, Ann, I was just saying that we got Blue Hill and Ben Coates that have also joined us. So I was just going to introduce them also. So we've got Willie Hill down there in Australia. We've got Ben Coates who I kind of kidnapped there for a minute from uh, Ann Kid yesterday and used him and everything for my show. But it was a great show, great discussion about e-commerce and uh, business in general. So thank you, Ben, for joining me yesterday. And it was a great uh, time to get to know you even more. I mean, we're always talking on here, but that was a more extended version of our conversation. So I just wanted to thank you for joining us again here on IBM.TV in this lovely roundtable panel discussion. As you recall, Ben, J.H. Kim was actually making comments on our show during the time that we were talking with e-commerce and she's joined us as a guest here today. So Ben, meet J.H., J.H., meet Ben. So just wanted to introduce the uh, two of y'all here on IBM.TV and things of that nature. And I see that Willie Hill has joined us from Australia. So we've been talking about mental health and things along those lines because of JH's background. But um, if anybody else in the panel wants to jump into the discussion, I'm letting folks do that because sometimes Jim says that I hog the time. So I'm trying to do a better job of being a good referee and things of that nature. So matter of fact, I think that since Bill's been here, we haven't heard from Bill and he's all about politics. I'm going to let Bill talk because I personally think that the whole political spectrum has got some serious mental health issues. So that's the whole <laughs> mental spectrum. So I need to hear Bill's perspective. <laughs> okay. I, you know, I thank, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, I, 
you know, that raises an interesting, interesting question. And um, uh, for our guest, uh, what's your uh, diagnosis of our president? <laughs> given your background. So, so there is a woman who is a very esteemed professor at Yale named Bandy Zenobia Lee. And she is um, quite renowned because of her work on violence. And she's spoken out and written some books about um, our beloved um, POTUS. Um, and uh, unfortunately, diagnosis is overused and it may not be appropriate in a lot of cases. Really, my focus is about why we have such extremes in politics, right? And so you all can speak about that. And that to me is a spiritual and emotional question because this reactivity is a problem. We need to be more responsive. Well, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because um, reactivity, I think, is this part of our brain and responsive is this part of our brain. Mm -hmm. so right. I'd so I'd like the, you to talk about that. Oh, thank you. So the neuroscience is emerging and it's all integrative, right? So in terms of mm -hmm. our thinking about how we react, Holistically, it's all happening everywhere in our body. Really, we need to focus on what's important first. How are we feeling? What's going on somatically? Is there a tingling in my feet? Can we be present? That takes about 20 minutes to sit and be still, let ourselves kind of meditate within our body and breathe. We need to breathe. Then we can start to focus on our mental, emotional well-being because we can look at how are we feeling? What is it bringing up? Where are we feeling it? How can we support it? Is it in our neck, our heads, our shoulders? Then we can start to respond rather than react because a lot of the reactions are fear-based. That's what I'm noticing with the DNC and any political party. They're trying to create a system where they're controlling the situation, right? But unfortunately that control is ephemeral and it's transient. Really what we want control of is ourselves. We don't need to project more onto other people. Well, uh, no, go ahead, Mark. No, go ahead, uh, Bill. I'm letting you go ahead with your question, so go ahead. Well, no, no, actually it was more of an observation and uh, it's, you know, and it touches on the point of reactivity. Um, so much, uh, we heard from a, a, another guest uh, on a, a different panel that, uh, we, political decisions are motivated by uh, our feelings. And so therefore it's emotionally based. And in that regard, it is reactive uh, rather than um, say being more thoughtful about the approach and framing the nature of the issue before trying to figure out what the problem is. Now, it, in our hyper um, focused world uh, with constant stimulation, 24 hour news, what's the latest, what's the latest, Twitter, et cetera, uh, constantly checking to see if you've missed something. Um, I don't know how uh, you can necessarily break through with uh, the kinds of thought patterns uh, mm -hmm. that you are discussing. And I'd like to hear, because you're absolutely yes. correct, our current sort of, uh, process is highly reactive and, and it's cyclical, because one side won't stop. But go ahead. So may I address this yeah. because this is super important. Yeah. Management is the key, self-management. We have to realize what triggers us. If we can manage our environment and minimize stress, look at things that feed us in terms of our well-being and do those activities more than get exposure to triggers, then we can react in a reflexive way that's reflective of our, of our spiritual, mental, emotional well-being, right? So right now, politics is very sensitive to um, emotions. And the politicians are strategizing and manipulating yeah. those emotions yeah. very, very effectively. Yeah. So if we can look at the long-term um, goals that we have for ourselves in not only this moment, but ongoing, that will be important. And my grandfather and my other grandfather were very involved as devoted public citizens in Korea. So they gave me a lot of insight in terms of how to manage the interrelationship with people because that's all politics is. Mm -hmm. It's a game, it's a wonderful game, 
of how can we get our goals accomplished together? Are we going to fight each other? Or are we going to work diplomatically to get things done for the benefit of all? We need to collaborate and mediate. Yeah, we definitely need more collaboration. And I just want to bring Ben into the conversation because um, he's a media person, just like I'm a media person. And y'all are talking about like the psychology of politics and things of that nature. And I know that Ben's involved in the media down there and well, over there in the UK and all of that. And I remember um, Marshall McLuhan, I believe it was, talking about the message is the medium. And I think we're seeing more of that these days in the 21st century. So I was wondering if Ben could comment on that kind of comment that kind of concept. And I want to make sure that I've got the right person when I say Marshall McLuhan, but I think that that's the one from I remember in my journalism days. So yep. if you could talk about that whole concept of the medium being the message and even more so in this day, since I know that you've got some media and event experience. And ben, man. What's going on in London? Uh, no, no, Jim. No, no. <laughs> I, uh, I can actually tell you actually, but you, I mean, firstly, um, don't the don't the politicians have to engage the brain before we start talking about the brains that they don't use? <laughs> just a question. Just a question. I'm just asking. Put it out Allegedly. there. Allegedly. Asking uh, for a friend. <laughs> I noticed Bill doesn't make a comment then. I, I, I admire Bill because he, he goes through everything these politicians are saying and brings it back to our own language. And with the, you're the only person we understand, Bill. Honestly. <laughs> thank you. Just thank you for everything you do. Um, yes. you, it's a difficult job and probably the hardest election you will ever have to commentate on, I would imagine. Well, no, Ben, I'd rather hear about what's going on in London. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, let's, let's move on. I've got a question. What does mosquitoes, midges and ticks and coronavirus have in common? According today to a study, a military study, they all repel by, they're all repelled by a, um, an insect uh, repellent. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Don't apparently. tell us to drink insect repellent. No, I'm not, I'm not, don't, I'm not, do don't drink it. Please don't drink it. Yeah. The, Which one? A product, Which one? There's a product found in an insect, re insect repellent that can kill the strain of coronavirus that causes COVID-19. That's what a defense lab laboratory has said this afternoon in Britain. Um, so it's only pre preliminary finds at the moment. And please, as, as, Jim, as Jim says, don't go out and eat your insects. Uh, repellents at the moment uh, and because it, it may have to be diluted um, but please just hold off on that but yeah apparently so but we've had a really interesting week in Britain and it's mainly due to the schools going back and we're unsure whether we're going to ask secondary school students to wear masks or not so um, the, 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 we said no originally and then Boris did a U-turn uh, because the Welsh did, told uh, the Welsh and the Scots Parliament said that they were going to make fa uh, face mask recommend recommendations, but while all this was go while this started, our leader was camping in Scotland, and he was found by the Daily Mail in a tent uh, with his family. So it, wow. it's, I mean, the, 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 I know I know we're on staycations, but whether a, a country leader should be in a tent in the in in Scotland, I'm not too sure i'm not sure what the security were around that and if the security had their own tents or not um <laughs> but we will we will obviously yes so it's all going on it's a big week next week schools go back and it's going to be massive and it's not particularly the students my, my kids as you as you all know on here are five and eight i'm not too worried because uh, obviously the, the risk of infection is really 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 low but I am worried about the teachers, etc. That is my worry. And of course, when your kids are at school, you do make friendships with the teachers because they're looking after your kids for a full year. So, you know, even though the worry isn't with us as parents, with our children, although I do have a 14 year old going back and that's quite worrying. It's more about the people in the system that I'm going to worry about. Um, so, but of course, if we if we don't start and don't give it a go, how will we know? Yeah, that's very true. That's very true, Ben. Um, I was just curious if you could talk to us about because Jay is our special guest here today and everything, and she does a lot with um, special needs folks and things of that nature. Um, what are they doing in London with the special needs population in the schools that you're hearing about in your circle? So, is that a, um, a part of our society that they're addressing real well in London and England, or what are you hearing in that regards? We've always had schools that have accommodated people with with disabilities and uh, we have definitely got a i think we're more advanced than a lot of places in that regards to a certain degree 
we are, sometimes I feel that we put people with, with special requirements into a, a pitting hole and we feel the job's done. So we don't actually understand what they want. And of course, putting them in the situation when they need to be is the first step. Understanding their needs is the second step. Uh, so, I, you know, we, we've got a lot to learn, a lot to learn in that respect. And I've spoken about it many times. I'm involved in this Lexic Awards. Um, and I know a lot of uh, entrepreneurs that actually do only employ employ dyslexia, other dyslexia people that have the, the sensitivity, the the, the they, because obviously when you have dyslexia, one sense becomes a lot higher than the others because that's kind of com that's compensating for the dyslexia. And they look for the different comp compensation areas and they pair them together and then all of a sudden you get, you know, a person that's really good at one, you know, different areas of, of the of the of the mind. So we do we are starting to understand as we should, but I do get a little bit worried that we put people into into and it's not just schools, Mark. It's also mm -hmm. employment. As I yeah. said to you the other day, I, I interviewed a guy with uh, 27 brain operations by the age he was two, uh, spina bifida, uh, another disease which I can't remember, uh, and he's going to get through coronavirus. But he's actually been uh, for five months isolated, totally isolated. Now, there is a reason for that. But when you when when we've isolated people for the coronavirus problem, isolating is okay. But isolation means you're away from people. It doesn't mean you're, you're out of touch with people. And I get the feeling, again, we've misunderstood what isolation means in respect to the coronavirus. Yes, isolate them for medical reasons, but don't isolate them. You know, we've got the technology now where we can interact with them. Uh, luckily, is in some of the, the forums that I'm involved with in events. So we've, you know, we've taken it to him. We've, we've involved him in podcasts, etc. But of course, we're the people. We should, we should, of course, we should do that as humanity. But there is other people that have are far, in far more privileged positions that should be supporting people a lot more during this. Yeah, definitely. Great point. I want to bring uh, Jay back in. I want to get to Willie as well. But um, Jay, I remember a show that I was doing and we had some people that were um, advocates of the um, disabled community and things of that nature. I think that I mistakenly used the word handicapped one time and they kind of like called me out to the carpet for that. So I was wondering if you could talk to us around this panel and everything and those that are watching, what is the correct terminology to use? Because I think that sometimes a lot of folks think about this terminology and we just use words that we've heard, whether that's handicapped, whether that's disabled, whether that's whatever. But I'd like to know from your studies and your advocacy work, what is the correct word to use? So I'm vertically challenged and I hear a lot of challenges like uh, are how people frame their, um, you know, their challenges. Um, I like to ask the particular people how they want to frame it because that's really up to them. Um, and I think being more sensitive to how they identify will you know, empower them and your relationship with them. Um, there's a lot of politically correct terminology. I'm not sure that um, it's always effective. And I came from Brown where PC Man was started um, with a cartoon. I think it's been co-opted by many people, the terms of political correctness um, and the actual intention was to honor that particular person right so um, to be sensitive to what they want to be called or um, really focus on their positives sounds like a Can great I... idea to concentrate on those positives I think um, Bill had a question and I think Jim had a question okay sorry Jim but uh, no no uh, well I guess uh, my question is uh, at a more basic level because I think uh, uh, our audience will know. When you approach someone, uh, how do you actually ask them how they uh, would like to uh, uh, be addressed without offending them? I mean, it, it's a basic thing. I, and, and I think that might be an issue that uh, some people are uncomfortable with. How do you actually ask somebody how they would like to be identified? Uh, is there a, a way that you find to be more successful? I think that was wonderful. Like, how do you want to be identified? How do we, um, how do we want to be projected in terms of our persona? That's really important. Um, it's so unique. So if you can just start that conversation with them in a sensitive way as you did, and in terms of LGBTQ, even uh -huh. I try to put she, her um, on my emails and communication. That's a big thing here in the Bay Area. It should be more common. Um, and, you know, 
how we identify ourselves, how we want other people to identify ourselves. The more clear we can make that and communicate that, the easier it'll be for people. So, um, so I love, I just wanted to give a shout out to Ben for talking about dyslexia because that whole universe of that demographic is astounding. The power and the information and the specialization that people who have dyslexia bring to our world, you know, they're able to see things in a different way that I don't see things and my brain doesn't work that way. And I think it's incredibly wonderful that companies are looking for people who have dyslexia. But but unless you understand that world, then, then there is ignorance. But it's like everything you've been talking about, everything is context. Mm -hmm. Now, the same word can mean something very different depending on the context it's discussed. Uh, and from what Bill just said, um, you know, and how do you address people? Again, Bill, it depends. It depends a lot on tonality. It depends. You know, obviously, writing it, emails is different. I mean, we're we're, we're very. Um, you know, this is an excellent, such a great uh, concept. IENTV. We're very open. We're very, you know, natural with each other. Um, there's no preconceived ideas. And this is the problem. If if everybody had that, we'd be in a better world. Because when you receive yeah. an email. It's like, and, and like um, the good lady just said, which it's it's how you address it. Now, the obvious thing to put is dear, dear such and such. And that is the neutral position to take. Mm -hmm. But when you get to know somebody, and this is the problem is that political correctness has taken over our world. And it, it again, the political correctness can never be taken in context. And so, you know, when, when Mark made the error, we know Mark, we know Mark didn't make that error of, of what he said in, in, any aggression, right. you know, somebody, somebody said to Mark, and he's, you know, Mark's admitted on here. So if he said it in, in any aggression, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't admit that story on here. He said, he said it and then went, okay, I, I haven't said it correctly. I do apologize. This is right. the way it meant. And unfortunately, with the Twitter army are too quick to pick up on it and create yeah. a storm, yeah. uh, to create a storm, which isn't there. And this is the problem we get, you know, and, and, and it's all about context. And this is what is worrying about. This is why video has to take over the written word on social media, because you can put the context across. And this is the great thing. Obviously, we're talking to the converted rule on here, giving context to what we're saying. The written word, you can say one statement and three different people create it three different ways, depending on many things, including how their day is going. For example, who's won the election the night before us? We've discussed that today. There you go. There's been, you know, bringing it back to that. If, if you know, for example, if you're a Republican and the Democrats win, the, the Republicans could be in a foul mood on, yeah. on, on April the 16th next year when it's finally decided. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think I just want to encourage people to really look at that because um, visual spatial people need images. A lot of our world is visual spatial, whereas some people are more auditorily sensitive. Right. We all have different ways that we learn best. If we can honor that, the multimodality um, will be better off. Thank you. Yeah. Um, our staff has gotten on our case, Jim, so I'm going to say that I passed attention and all of that. So I'm going to do a quick roundtable introduction for our panel and things along those lines. So we're going to start off on my uh, left, uh, at least it's to my left right now. Um, we've got Jim Ede, who is a master chess player and a wonderful gentleman. I'm glad that I sometimes have him as a special co-host on my variety of shows that I do here on IBM.TV. So, Jim, thank you for uh, stepping in with me on occasion uh, when I need you and everything. So definitely uh, wanted to say that. I'm Mark Lee. I do uh, three shows here on IBM.TV where we cover a variety of issues and things of that nature. We try to have these kinds of engaging conversations. I was very glad to have Ben Coates on one of the shows, the first show yesterday, and then I had a fashion friend on on the second show and I'm trying to get them involved as well. I know that Jim met my uh, fashion friend and uh, she praised his hat. So for those of you who don't, don't know, the hat was uh, smoking and she really liked the hat and everything. So Jim was a uh, Definitely going on, and that's who I am. We've got Willie Hill. We haven't heard from Willie Hill, but we do going to have some conversation with him as well. He's over there in Australia. So as soon as I finish these introductions, I'm going to bring Willie into the conversation because I do need to hear what's happening in Australia. We've got my new friend that I've become friends with over the uh, last couple of months. She's definitely a fan of IBM.TV. She thinks that we are just spectacular and wonderful. She will oftentimes send me notes saying that I learned this or that from IBM.TV. So she is definitely a big time fan of ours. And I think that I heard, Jim, did you hear what I think I heard? Because I think I heard 
Nick say that he might be open to the ideas of us doing a show around mental health before I jump into the conversation. So I think that JH may be being invited into our family. So that's what <laughs> I think I heard. Did you, the, the rest of the panel think that they heard that as well? Because that's I the impression that I got. So that's what yeah. I think I heard. And so if we get all of us together, said, then we can yeah. convince Nick that he said it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And then we've got Bill Tresvon. Me and Bill have just become friends over the last several weeks and everything, but I am definitely uh, proud to call him my new friend and everything like that. I also have had some background in politics and activism, so we've had a couple of conversations both here on IBM.TV as well as some involving just regular phone conversations among ourselves. So definitely I'm glad to have Bill Tresvon as a new friend and as one that is definitely engaged in our political world over there in D.C. and in social activism. And then we've got somebody that I got to know a lot better yesterday. We were already becoming friends. He was giving me a hard time for giving the London and England abuse and for teasing him about his kids and all of that. But Ben Coates is an amazing gentleman. And like I said, I got to know him a lot better yesterday when we had him as a guest on my show. So definitely it was great having him involved. And he's just an amazing person. So that's the panel as we've got it right now. I think Ank is sitting there somewhere in the corner in the cut. And he may pop in as well as will Nick. They might pop in also. So don't be surprised if you don't see them pop in. But right now, Ank is sitting in the cut back there in the backstage or wherever he's doing, doing his work and everything. But I'm sure, as Jim knows, they are keeping an eye on us all the time. So like I said, even when we don't see them, they're around there, lurking around, oh. talking about what we're either doing right or not doing right. So Hank is alone. one of the leaders of the group that, uh, in terms of the IBM TV leadership family. I like to think of it as Kim, uh, Nick, and Anka. Those are kind of like the people that are uh, the coaches of this team. I like to think of them as the coaches of our team. So that's who we got on the panel right now. I do want to turn it over to Mr. Willie Hill. And like I told him before, I've got a friend who's a musician. Actually, Mark, uh, Jim, you have to go. So if you want to get your question in, and Willie will get your question in. Yes. We that? That's yep. cool. Uh, okay, Jim. I should. Okay, well, I should have a question prepared. How did you all come to IBM TV? Okay, well, oh, Jim, that's a good question. I, 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 well, I want, excuse me, Mark. I've got to pick in where we left off was yes. we were talking about the challenges and the words that we use to describe them. And uh, I can tell you the chess perspective, which is really all that matters. And I also tell you that I am follically challenged. And um, what happened to me was I got uh, melanoma on my scalp and forehead, and I had some Mohs surgery. And so I had to wear a hat to protect myself. And then when I started wearing this hat, it became part of my personality. So it really, made a big difference to me but we i have been part of the world chess championships for juniors and we say for players with disabilities and because we emphasize their players you know first and foremost they play chess and that's the emphasis that we put on it and so uh this has been one of the best things i've ever done in my life uh helping out in those tournaments uh so then uh please i'd like to hear from willie uh, yeah, as so well Willie, I wanted to hear from you yeah. talking about Australia, what's going on in Australia. But we can actually tie the questions in together. Before we get to how um, Australia is doing with mental health and all of that, JH asked the question of how you got involved. I had already told her one time before that I was invited because of my podcasting background to be on Podcasters Thursday. That grew into several shows. And from those several shows, I am now a um, producer, not just of my own shows, but of a couple of other folk shows. And I think me and Jim, if I'm reading the signals right, are being approached to be like on the executive board kind of, thing, kind of deal and everything. So that's kind of where my involvement is. Willie, it's on you. Talk about your involvement. And also, if you want to talk about Australia and mental health. Okay. Uh, uh, way back when this thing, before IBM TV kicked off, or when it was just evolving, um, I came across Nick, and, uh, the, and he was talking about IBM TV. And I said, hey, I'd like to be part of that. Uh, this would have been last year sometime. I'm in the startup space. And uh, I admin startup groups in Facebook and LinkedIn, um, Australia. And um, somebody was asking for a, an admin in a Europe B2B startup. And they have like 17,000 groups. So I lifted up my hand. And now I'm admin for a Europe B2B startup group. 
So that's how I'm involved in the startup. I'm also putting together fintech products that matches uh, investors to startups uh, and all the due diligence. I, I, I call it burger the lot or startup the lot. You know, you have due diligence, you have your co-founders, you have uh, your pitch decks, how to put... A lot of times when people helping startups, they already have their hand out. You know, if you want this, um, it, you, you got to pay. There's just no way around that. And what I'm trying to do is take the startup to exit in Series A, like a five-year journey, hold hands with them all the way through that journey. So that that way, uh, the whole process is done. So he has somebody in his corner saying, okay, just slow down for that one. Okay, this one here, we need to get more clients or more people in, uh, more, you know, so that you can scale up or maybe we need to go across. Sorry, yes. I love what you said. And may I ask you a question? Because yes. I do some business consulting here. Um, because we're in the Silicon Valley space, I yes. have a lot of friends and family who are experienced with startups. Um, and one of them in particular, um, I was giving some advice to because she hired a coach who okay. um, can help her with her startup, but it was very high overhead. And when yes. I was um, talking with her, um, I realized that she's not experienced and she's naive about yes. the startup space. Um, and there's a lot of sharks, venture capital sharks, which oh, I used yeah. to be in that space. So um, she doesn't know that most of the time you try to turn away money. I would say that 98% of the money that you're offered should be, <laughs> you should be cautious with. How do you structure your five-year coaching? Okay, uh, that, the first, first off, I do a mind, body, spirit component to it. Mind is the planning, body is the action, spirit is the network, okay? One of the things I emphasis, my emphasis is on is uh, we do ice bath. So that way, me and the startup, like we bond. We bond in this space. Uh, there's three ways I can um, engage you in a near-death experience. I can take you bungee jumping. I can take you skydiving. And we can do an ice bath. So one of the things I can, one of the things that, that comes up for me is I'm trying to do startups in a prison setting, take mm. it into prison to rehabilitate prisoners. Okay. I can't take the prisoners skydiving. I can't take them bungee jumping. So uh, ice bath is the only one that's open to me. Um, and when you go through that process, you come out on the other side, you're totally transformed. Uh, you're very present to where you are. Your relationship with the people in your close proximity is m at a much better level because you can engage with them. You're more present. You're more mindful of who they are, what they are. Um, you know, like a lot, of, a lot of times you see husband and wives. The uh, wife's telling the husband, didn't you just hear me? And the husband's looking at his uh, mobile phone and, oh, what? Sorry. You know, there, there's no... Nobody's being present there. One's on the left side, one's on the right side. <laughs> Are you bringing this to like globally to prison populations? Because we have a big problem. I think this could be easily translatable. This is wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I own I own a streaming platform also that I'm going to I'm building my own content and I'm going to hook it up onto the streaming platform. So that's what I'm looking at doing. <laughs> And it's definitely an issue that needs to be addressed on a, a global level. I agree with JH on that and everything. And also, Willie, one of the things that aggravates me, not as much now in the COVID era, because yes. you're not seeing as many people going to the restaurants, but I could not stand it when I would go to restaurants and see, it wasn't just young couples. It wasn't just the millennials and the Gen Zs. You would also see sometimes old couples and they'd be sitting there on their phones or on their cell phones having a conversation with who knows whom, but they weren't having a conversation with each other. So you're sitting there going like, what the heck are y'all doing? Because like I said, you're not even engaged in the conversation with each other. You're having a conversation with the rest of the world. And I see that Ben's also Mark, got a question and Jim's got a question. Can I yeah, go to Jim first? Yeah, Jim's got to go. So I'd like to her to tell us, how did you get involved in IBM TV? Ah, uh, so I saw Ankit's question. Um, 
I was introduced to IBM through uh, Mark. So thank you so much for being here. I had so much fun. I learned from you and have a wonderful safe day. Thank Bye. you and goodbye. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you for joining us. Um, ben, I don't know whether the question was towards yeah. uh, JH or whether it was no. a general question, but if it's a general question, I'm turning it over to you. It was to Willie. Willie, oh. you've, you've got the bungee jump and you've got the ice baths. Why can't they bungee jump into the ice baths? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh... I've got a new concept. I've, I've, where's my book? All right, I'm writing that one. Well, I'm like, that if one. we're going to do concepts and everything, they don't have to bungee jump into the ice bath. Aren't you the owner of a company that does drone flying so they could, uh, you know, do some sort of drone journey wow. into the ice bath? So, like I said, I don't know what that drone journey would be, but we could tie the drone industry into the ice bath. Yeah, I'll do a virtual <laughs> ice bath. Yeah. Well, well, no, actually, Willie, I, I'm really interested because I started thinking about it when uh, you mentioned an ice bath and going in on the one side. And first, I was like, yep. no way, that's crazy. And then I started thinking when you said you emerged on the other side as a different person. And then I yep. started thinking, how many bags of ice would it take for me to put in my tub? But uh, I guess, but that leads me to this question. What kind of transformation? I mean, did, is it the shock yep. of the ice? And then uh, how, long in, how long do you stay in? And, you know, uh, okay. do you need medical attention when you get out? No, no, no none of that. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's all dependent. It's like getting a baptism. Or getting baptized, you submerge in water, and then they pull you up. The dilemma when you're doing it is you don't know when you're gonna come up. You like gasping for air, gasping air, like let it be now, let it be now. You want out of the situation, but it's beyond your control because somebody else is calling the shot. Hmm. You know? and that's, I've got an and idea, that's... and Jim might back me up on this idea because you know <laughs> I know we're not supposed to uh, get overly uh, politicized and things of that nature, but we do like to talk about folks in DC and everything. Hey, Willie, uh, you think that we can arrange an ice bath for the person currently sitting at 1600 and some of his compatriots? Because I think that that could work. We could have an ice bath of them. <laughs> this idea of a new person is ringing a bell here. I, yep. I like yep. that. It's, yeah. quite, it's yep. quite frosty over there anyway in the States. I don't think the ice bath's needed, is it, at the moment? <laughs> they are in California. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, think, I think it's a little too late, uh, you know, because we are in we are in full-blown season right now, and the, the gloves are off. Um, but, you know, uh, we'll yeah. see. Yeah, so, the gloves are totally off, and I'm going to actually get serious. I did watch a little bit <laughs> of the uh, – of the uh, Trump show, or what I'm calling the convention, non-convention that's going on. I only watched a few minutes yesterday, but I did see some of uh, the first lady's speech, and I thought that I was actually, I'm actually going to give some kudos, and I don't usually give kudos to the other side, but in my opinion, that was a masterful attempt at a deflection. So, like I said, you know, if you know, sometimes you redirect and things of that nature, and I do think that in terms of her trying to frame the conversation as a redirect, that that was actually pretty good. And I understand from reading and do, looking online that she actually, unlike the last speech where I think she copied it and there was a whole conversation, it's my understanding that she was involved in the writing. It wasn't bad. And so I don't even know that the current person sitting in 1600 knew what she was going to say. But in terms of a speech, and I did do the debate club and things of that nature, I thought it was an effective speech, but I want to hear what Bill thinks about the speech. Because I did think that she was doing some deflections and some other things that they asked her to do on a debate team. And I, and I know Nick, and who's joined us now, was on a debate team. So as a debate strategy, was that a good speech? Because I thought it was actually done masterfully. Well, I I, I think this, that um, if they had uh, kept, well, her tone and... Right. Uh, her, the rhythm and the message of her speech, highly effective. However, yeah. in many respects, it was overshadowed by all of the, if you, you know, when you watch the entire program or uh, day two of the convention, there was just so much that had built up. Her voice was accentuated, uh, her speech was accentuated as a clarion voice that was so distinct and different that it hit a different note. And that's why it stood out. Now, had the Republican convention had that theme throughout the course of the evening or even the day before, we'd be talking about very different things. But, Mark, I think you're right. I don't know necessarily that it was a deflection. Uh, my initial reaction to uh, her speech, my gut reaction, 
was that it was authentic. And, you know, I don't, it, it's just a feeling you get sometimes, all of us have it in different places, but I felt that she was actually authentic in what she was discussing. Now, I thought some of the uh, items and the placement of it was really to humanize her husband, but I think that she knew where it needed to go. Uh, but I'll turn it over to Nick. Nick? Oh, yeah. You're, are you talking about the um, Republican first, National Convention thing last night? Yes. Yes, in the first oh, lady's I, speech. I, 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 I thought, uh, you, you know, I totally respect my sleep uh, more so than listening to that stuff. Okay. So I have to admit I was asleep. Uh, I had a great night's sleep because I didn't bother to listen to it. And here's the, here's the reality. I listen to Bill's Washington report every morning. And he updates me on everything in what five minutes. So why do I want to suffer through three hours or two hours or whatever the heck they are of some guy's party and parade when I need a five minute update brief and then I get to go back to work? Okay, so I don't listen to it. That's just okay. me. I didn't listen to either side. I have no intention to. I'm just going to listen to the five minute update from Bill and then I keep moving on. Uh, you know, there are some pundits that you know they do want to spend all their time and yeah. listen. But that's not me. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not into that stuff. I mean, it's like, right. are you kidding me? You know, somebody's a three-hour commercial on whatever the heck they're right. they're doing. But in a five-minute update, Bill gave me a five-minute update. The most important thing I gathered from that Bill is you said 97% of the Americans have already made up their mind. Yes, a new point. Which I don't know where you got that data from, but to me, I listened to your whole report, and when he said that, I was going like, wow, that's kind of interesting. The election has already been decided, basically, which when we did our report on coronavirus, we said, well, the vaccine's already there. It just hasn't been tested and proven, which is true. We also predicted we're going to be well over 100,000 a long time ago, and probably you're right. The election has already been decided, but in the meantime, they're going to spend a half a billion dollars right. advertising. And that and that's just the presidential campaigns. That's uh, the president, yeah, just the presidential campaign. Okay, now, now check this out. The math doesn't ever make sense to me. Why would you spend a half a billion dollars to get a job that pays you 400,000? Okay, there's something yeah. that, um, you know, there's something corrupt about that, uh, that just right off the bat. But argumentatively, they control multi-trillions of dollars. So they're willing to spend a half a billion dollars to do that to try to convince maybe what, a half a dozen people or a very small percentage to change their mind maybe. But I will also tell you this, at least in my opinion, the media does have a lot of influence because when people listen to the media, no matter how bad it is, no, no matter what the story is, it goes into your mind. Right. Like, and it says, oh, Biden can't be trusted, or it goes in your mind, oh, can't have another four years. In other words, what they're doing is they're infiltrating everybody's mind with a statement so they could, you know, repeat it over and over again. It's almost like all they're trying to do is brainwash people with these commercials. And they're they're absolutely, I mean, absolutely hilarious. Now, uh, I know Willie just left us, but from my understand from our other person in Australia is that um, a lot of the world believes Trump's going to win because the media controlled by Rupert Murdoch says so, and that's all they listen to. So they believe it's going to be a landslide for Trump. Now, I listen to the media here and they say it's 10 points for Biden, but it also tells me the power of media internationally as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's it'll, it'll be interesting. And um, Bill's going to do his report every day. I'll listen to his report, but in terms of the garbage all day long, frankly, I don't have the time for that. You know, listen to people talk, you know, yeah, to do a, a lot of sense. I think that, uh, Jim had a question. So Jim, what was your yeah. question? Thanks, um, because uh, I agree with what Nick is saying about the media, but uh, my question to Bill is, uh, and thank you for watching it when I could not uh, and summarizing it for me, but I did read that uh, on the first day they made a uh, factual misstatement and the fact checkers called them out on it. And then last night I was watching a little bit of it and Rand Paul said the exact same thing that the fact checkers had refuted the day before about troop withdrawals. Okay, well, um, Senator Paul threw that out there, and it, you know, it, it was a one, it was a, uh, a simple sentence, but it has, in, you know, immeasurable uh, implications around the world. Uh, talking about uh, the withdrawal of foreign aid and or the withdrawal of uh, American troops. Uh, but before I, I continue with that, I do want to point out that Jim on the uh, fact checker uh, line. What uh, I did not think our audience necessarily needed was the full frontal attack on Hunter Biden by yeah. uh, Pam Bondi. It was uh, filled with 
mistruth. Uh, it, it was essentially a, a speech of lies uh, that had been disproven over time. And quite frankly, I was uh, I was actually shocked that uh, she would uh, press ahead. But then it occurred to me, Jim, as you pointed out, on day one of the Republican National Convention, uh, that was the way that this campaign decided that they were going to proceed. And so they followed that up with day two and some of the more shocking things that uh, just frankly didn't deserve uh, airtime, which is why I didn't include it. But um, with the exception, as Mark noted, of uh, the First Lady's speech, I think that's what we're going to see. So, Jim, um, and to our audience, misinformation is going to be the coin of the realm over the next uh, you know, yeah. 68 days. And uh, Jim, Willie? Uh, before they get to that, along those same lines, and I do want to hear from Jim and Willie as well, but along those same lines, I don't want folks to get it twisted. There was some miscommunications even in the First Lady's speech and everything. So there were some things that even she said wrong. Because I think that she said that her husband was the first one to speak in front of the UN to like talk about um, religious diversity and things of that nature. And the fact checkers clearly went out there and found like um, Obama both Bushes. I'm sure they could have even gone back further and found some other ones. But there were several uh, presidents have, that have spoken about um, religious tolerance and religious diversity and things of that nature. So she did try to paint that. And Bill, um, with the two of the uh, African-American brothers that are here on IBM.TV, and if I hear that they are rescuing the HBCUs again, I think I'm going to scream because every time I turn around, they're bringing somebody out talking about how he is the great rescuer of the HBCUs around the country. And mm -hmm. while there might be some truth about some things going on with the HBCUs and our current government, I can't buy that he's the great rescuer of Howard University, North Carolina Central University, Fisk, and I could go on naming a number of them. Okay, listen, on that point, and it wasn't worth including in uh, the report for our viewers, uh, there was the underlying comparison of, uh, look, on day one, they compared him to uh, the char fictional character from It's a Wonderful Life. On day two, uh, they invoked uh, Lincoln heavily. I mean, from his uh, boyhood home, which is actually not his boyhood home, that's a replica, and they actually don't know what Lincoln's uh, boyhood home is, uh, ever looked like. Uh, but that was that's a minor thing. But they invoked the, uh, the image uh, and the legacy of Abraham Lincoln, which I found astounding, because his policies are the exact opposite. But that didn't need, necessarily need airtime. But Mark, you're correct. This sudden emphasis on their outreach to the African-American community uh, is part of their strategy, not to get votes, but rather to confuse uh, Joe Biden's base and get them to pause. Because there's, there's really no way, at least according to the polls and the information we have, that uh, Donald Trump is going to uh, get a significant a part of the African-American vote. I believe right now the percentages are in the African-American community that it's about 87% or 90% that are supporting uh, Joe Biden, which is why it's going to be a ground game of getting them out. But it's just another misdirection. Abraham Lincoln, I mean, it was an infomercial. And Nick, I'm glad you got some sleep because, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it, it wasn't worth it. And I left out a lot of stuff that just did not need a repeating. Yeah. Uh, ben, sorry, Nick and Ben, because I know Ben may have a little bit, Nick. Well, I, I'd, I'd like to hear from Willie Hill, because I heard from our other Australian friend, Shaquille Latmer, that um, the, the news in Australia is that Trump's going to win and he's a big leader. Do you hear that over in Australia, mate? Uh, no, I'm really sorry. I must apologize. I am not in American politics at all. Oh, that, that, no, no, you don't have to apologize. You're one of the smart <laughs> ones, obviously. <laughs> Stay away from this this stuff. Let's go to go to um, our friends in Great Britain, our overlords, the person, the group that created all our problems because they couldn't <laughs> keep control of us. If they could, we wouldn't have that problem. We would just hail to the queen, but well, we don't mean, do that over here. You mean the French who were the inventors of colonialism? Isn't that we, what you're getting at? The, the, yes, the inventors of colonialism <laughs> and law and order as we the know it. Never our overlords, word. our wonderful people in Great Britain, Ben, what's the uh, status of the U.S. politics over there, mate? I've, I've missed you, Nick. I, you the last <laughs> I know. I know. What, what would you do over over in the pond? What would you do on the other side of the pond without us? 
<laughs> well, hey, we, we saved your bacon one year. I remember that. <laughs> I've discussed a lot about the American politics. It is well covered in the UK. Obviously, there's a massive interest, especially because of Brexit. You know, we need the states right. to we need the states for a trade deal. It's as simple as that. You know, we're kind of out on our own at the moment. As for what the UK's opinion is, uh, if you ignore a lot of the noise on again on social media, I think it's the closest race we've had for years. And the worrying thing that came out last week or the back or the start of this week was that. If the result, it was the Trump statement about the result will be challenged. Why you, you, you're then into the realms of dictatorships, not that the states is a dictatorship, but the dictatorships and, and what and how elections are perceived in dictatorships. If you start challenging the results legally, you know, I understand when the, the results are very, very close that there may be challenges, etc. But we have to accept that we are in the free world, our countries are in the free world. And we are democracies, and whatever is said has to be accepted, surely, going forward, because it's, you're setting dangerous precedents. And I think the UK is very, very worried about that at the moment, is, is the way that your election will end. And I made a joke about April the 16th, but I wouldn't be surprised if we're still going on in January, you know, in inauguration day. You know, it's worrying. Where, 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 where are you going? Well, well, you're look, making a you, joke you about it, but I'm actually going to, and thinking that it's going to be July 1st, which is my birthday, that we actually decide the presidency. So I'm looking at it like a seven month time frame before we get out of here, because like I said, there's too many things we got in the mail. It might take them forever to get that off and everything. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to turn it over to Nick and Jim and everything, but I've got to get ready to bounce off because I've got a Zoom call to do because I've got to help find a, uh, speaking of presidents, I've got to help find a CEO of of a theater so we've been doing these zoom interviews and things of that nature so i'm here to bounce off and do that i think we've got our last candidate and then we'll narrow it from seven to four and then hopefully we'll be down to one we won't have a runoff we won't have anything like the presidential election so our process will be much quicker maybe they need to hire me as a consultant in order for us to have a better version of it um that being said i do want to thank uh our special guest that was on earlier, J.H., she is a new friend of mine, and I was glad that she was on, and I understand from Ankit and others that she might be appearing on a regular basis. Um, just to let you know, Nick, me and Jim think that we heard you say that you're going to like push us to get a show for her on and everything, so we're already <laughs> pushing that. So we think we heard you say that, so you've given a thumbs up, so definitely that's a good thing. So, And I've got some fashion people, and Jim can tell you more about her as well, so we're pushing some new hosts on. So. And I think Ben might want us to get the e-commerce business lady on because I know they were over there just joking with each other and having a good time. So we're always recruiting new people on. So I'm trying to get us some new hosts and new things going on because we are a growing company and we're doing some amazing things. So, Nick, I want to give you thanks for putting this powerful platform together because you've done a spectacular job along with Kim and Ankit. So as I get ready to bow out of this conversation, I do want to thank you for all the great work that you are doing because I'm a big fan of this network. I'm finding other folks that are big fans as well and trying to bring them into our family as we share our family to the globe. Yeah, so make sure you go to the online dinner party tonight at uh, yeah. IBM TV with Mark Lee. Yeah, you know. speaking of the online dinner party, I want all y'all to watch. I cannot tell y'all, but uh, there's a couple of catches here. We, as part of the online dinner party, we are having mystery guests. The mystery guest will be a historical figure or something like that. And no, I'm not going to do a seance or anything like that. But we're going to bring them into the show, so they will be mystery guests. If you watch the banner, you will see clues. It might be a quote. It might be something about their lives or things of that nature. So I want you to watch. We're going to play a game. That's the game. You have to guess who the mystery guest is. One of the things that I did intentionally, Willie, Ben, you'll be glad to know this, is I picked an international guest and I picked somebody that might be more known here in the States and everything like that. But even they might be obscure. So definitely just kind of watch the clues, try to get everything. The catch is that the show is between four and seven. So I need you to tell me who the people are that are the mystery guests within that context of the time frame. Because the one thing I don't want to have happen is somebody to go back on YouTube and tell me that, and I'm just going to use this as an example, it's not our mystery guest today, but say it's Harriet Tubman. I don't want you to go in there and tell me that Harriet Tubman was the mystery guest at like 10 o'clock when the show is 4 to 7 Eastern Standard Time, because that means that you're cheating. So I and, don't need and, any cheats in there. And, and Mark, it's 4 o'clock in the morning till 7 o'clock in the morning 
Malaysia time. So right. they can get up in the morning in Malaysia. <laughs> you can down. watch the monthly. I got that down, man. So this way we know what time it is in Malaysia. You're having breakfast with Mark Lee and <laughs> dinner with Mark Lee at the same time. <laughs> the morning, breakfast with Mark Lee in and Malaysia. Good yeah, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. <laughs> only on IBM TV. That's pretty cool. So, all right. So the dinner party is uh, at at tonight. Great. Thanks again, Mark. All right. Thank, thanks, Mr. Mark. No problem. Namaste, as I would say, I guess. Or namaste. Uh, namaste. Yeah, eventually I get it right. Well, all of that. All of that just to say bye bye. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, it takes takes time. It takes time over here. Come on, you Brits. I mean, the thing is, what do you do? You know, you. Kick, kick well, those people out. We're trying I mean, to get people to slow down. I was yeah. waiting for Bill to come back to me on what I said about. <laughs> I, I, I've, been, I've been waiting. Uh, you know, so, uh, but no, Ben. Uh, live TV. Okay. First, <laughs> what I want to do for uh, our worldwide audience, particularly uh, Willie and Australia, um, I want to give you the uh, latest uh, uh, polls. Uh, uh, nationally, Biden leads um, Trump by uh, seven point eight points, and uh, so that's outside the margin of error with regard to these polls. So that's a solid lead for uh, Joe Biden. But as we drill down uh, in the battleground states, Joe Biden is up approximately by 3.7 points in the in the six battleground states as an average. All six averaged out. Uh, he's ahead 3.7 points. And so uh, in the battleground states, it's it's a little closer. But Trump is down both uh, nationally and then in the battleground states. And then here uh, for some of our, since it, it, you know we were all around financial interests, uh, the latest betting odds uh, on the presidential election are giving uh, Biden a 54.3% chance of winning and Trump only 45. So those are people that are putting down real do dollars and right. betting on it. So to the extent that our worldwide audience can get a sense of where the selection is. It's 96% uh, of the population uh, has apparently made up their mind, but they're not telling anybody. But those that are talking uh, have Biden ahead by about eight points nationally and about four points in the battleground states. So we'll see. Uh, it may tighten up, but I doubt given uh, what we've seen with the uh, Republican National Committee's uh, family Trump show. But, uh, you know, well, I, don't, Bill, ben, I don't know if that's helpful. If Biden wins by 54%, won't he lose? No, no, because what you're, the, and you're right. And that's the difference between the national polls and then the polls in the battleground states. And so the question becomes in the battleground states, uh, the, uh, he is up, uh, the better say, 48% uh, to 44. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's in yeah. the battleground states. And the battleground states are the ones where uh, the additional electoral college. I, uh, you know, votes uh, counting comes in. And quite frankly, they, uh, they've begun to narrow it down. And I'm going to incorporate more of this as we move forward and get, uh, get past the Republican National Convention. Um, but they've narrowed it down to the states. Florida is leaning towards Biden. Uh, Pennsylvania is leading towards Biden. Wisconsin is leading towards Biden. Uh, Michigan and Minnesota. Um, and if Pennsylvania and Florida go for Biden, there's no way Trump would win everything else, but he would, uh, uh, Biden would win. Ankit? Just really so, uh, quickly. I had a word with a lot of our NRI friends and family based out of US, and uh, we were just discussing about uh, what, 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 what are the elections uh, going around and uh, where the uh, Indians are cutting votes uh, this time. So I got a mixed uh, reaction uh, because people who are in the businesses, they're happy with Trump because, uh, I mean, uh, since the Trump, uh, uh, come in the power, their business are flourishing and uh, they are doing good. Although COVID uh, definitely hits out, out but uh, they are still happy with Trump. But people who are in a different uh, field, uh, they have a mixed opinion about things. But more or less, if people think about country, they will definitely vote out for Biden. But if they think about themselves and uh, for the business and other things, uh, they will vote for Trump. That's what I have realized uh, uh, after today's conversation with my family members. And also on, on top of that, uh, uh, everyone says that Trump is uh, definitely, he doesn't know what he's speaking, but he is a uh, little bit like a front runner in terms of leadership because he doesn't care about anyone else. When it comes to Biden, he will think logically and that means he are he's trying to manipulate a lot of things and uh, trying to work it out uh, based on the balancing of the politics. So that's what uh, the feedback from our family friends uh, in US. And also, uh, I would like to uh, 
shout out for our uh, friend Zach Robertson. He's uh, undergoing surgery today, so uh, wish him for speedy recovery and so that he can uh, get well soon and join our family one more time. So he's in the hospital today for a surgery. Oh, really? And that's what oh, I was wow. popping back in for. I did have that meeting to go to and everything, but I definitely wanted to uh, shout out to our teammate here and everything. And the fact that he is having that surgery, as Anki just uh, alluded to, he's brought us a number of great guests from the funk world, as well as just musicians in general. So definitely just want to give him the uh, shout outs and um, our prayers and thoughts are with him. And we're hoping that he'll be right back with us again on this weekend. But definitely um, for those that are watching us here, do know that our prayers and talk with our colleague and our good friend, Zach Robertson. So I can make that comment and I just wanted to pop in really quickly to share and to amplify that as well. So I'm yeah, gonna pop Zach, off. You know, fun fun. Fun. I, did want to I, I learned a lot that. of fun from Zach and yeah. uh, he's getting shoulder, shoulder surgery and he's gonna yeah. bounce back just as good as ever, if not better. Yes, because we, 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 yeah. we, need, we need Zach. <laughs> We're world for World Peace Day. We're we're actually going to be filming World Peace Day. I need Zach. Yeah. To He's going to be there, to, yeah, to, to be there so that we get some musicians on World. But Peace you know Day. that uh, Nick uh, for Peace Day, our, our brand manager is Ben Coates from uh, London. Ben Coates from London. No, I said World Peace Day. I didn't say London Day. I said World <laughs> Peace Day. We're going to have Stevie Wonder, I believe, is going to be on our show. Who's not World Empire, Empire Day. Day? Not oh, World yeah. Empire. Yeah, World <laughs> Empire Day. Come on, dude. Okay, we'll get Ben on when we want to do World Empire Day. This okay. is World Peace Day. Strop shit. Strop shit. I think of <laughs> Strop shit. Mm -hmm. World Peace Strop Day. Shit. Not World Not Empire London. Day. The, yeah. the UK is bigger than London. The UK is bigger than the world. We all know that. But what, the UK is bigger what's than the Indian the food like there, Ben? <laughs> what, it's Strop shit. Okay, it's, it's, good. it's good, Jim. It's everywhere the Indian food is. Yeah, you don't need to go to India for Indian food. You know that. Anyway, I mean, that, yeah, that was one of their. their um, overlords they used to own india that was the what were they called that was the jewel of the empire they didn't care about the us they cared about india we own india baby 1.3 billion people uh, that's know. where the tea comes from and yeah the tea as, comes from as it started yeah. wednesday nick you missed last week uh jim has started up a new business it's called the sean connery um yeah. lookalike fund sean and connery is 90 years old uh, he, well he, look, look, i'll still uh, take it <laughs> yeah, he, he, he's a spitting image of Sean Connery, we decided last week, and it's his new business. So he's doing appearances, and yeah, congratulations, no. Sean. He was 90 last week. Oh, it's it's maybe, maybe it's really Sean Connery. <laughs> hey, wow. <laughs> they, they do look alike. <laughs> that is unreal. So that is that. bloody unreal. <laughs> which one is Sean Connery and which one is Jim? <laughs> yeah, look at this. Look at this. This is uh, unbelievable. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess the guy with that the chest Oh yeah, okay. All right, there we go. <laughs> guy with the guy with Bill, the chest That's a good. I gotta good, ask good. you this because yeah, you know, I I was just being a little facetious by saying he's got to win by a large margin. Right. But you're absolutely right that the swing states are the key, and the swing states that are in play shouldn't be swing states. They should just be dead red. It's well, actually, actually, that's true because you know uh, I mentioned the six states: uh, Minnesota, Michigan, um, uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Florida, and Georgia, Florida. and Arizona. And really? Georgia should well, not. What about, what about North Carolina? Aren't we in yeah. play? Well, North, North Carolina is in there, but either Pennsylvania or Florida, if we know one yeah. of them, both Pennsylvania goes, Florida. that'll go. Because if those two go, chances are North Carolina is going to go as well. But you're right. right, with North Carolina. But North Carolina normally should not be in play. Georgia should not be in play. Yeah. Texas, there should be no question okay. about Texas as well. And yeah. Iowa. The fact that Iowa is still uh, close, because I think that's within, there was in one or two points uh, in Iowa. And Iowa normally would not be in play. And Even then, Arizona. Yes, in Arizona. And then there's a further complication. And I, I'm sorry, uh, real quickly, Montana. Now, Montana is a solidly red state, but right. you have the former governor of Montana who's running for the Senate. And um, he, uh, at the Senate level, is currently up in his race, although in the presidential race, uh, it's close. But Montana should not be in play either. Ain't right. it? Yeah, ain't it? I just wanted to know from Bill that uh, I was watching uh, Pompeo's speech uh, yesterday uh, from Jerusalem, and uh, he was talking about a lot of things and all this stuff. But uh, I think uh, there is some debate going on uh, with Pompeo's speech. So would you like to share something about that, uh, Bill? 
Uh, yes, essentially, there's a, there's a law in the United States called the Hatch Act. And what the Hatch Act does is it forbids uh, federal, uh, federal officials from campaigning. Uh, and it prohibits them. It's a, a straight prohibition. So the question with Pompeo is, uh, he's uh, ostensibly in Israel on diplomatic uh, uh, assignment. And the taxpayers paid for uh, his trip. And then while he's over there, he used um, Jerusalem as a backdrop to then give a political speech. Now, the campaign is saying that, well, uh, they paid for the production and all of the logistics just for that event. Therefore, uh, he did it on his own time. But others are saying, no, he's over there. And the entire trip there, his accommodations and everything else, and the flight back are all paid for by the American uh, taxpayers. And therefore, giving a political speech uh, as an American diplomat on taxpayer dollars violates the hot pack. And that's triggered a number of investigations, uh, which uh, I, I hate to say, because I've really never seen this in our uh, American political history. We've had more investigations, whether it's ethics, uh, crossing the line, uh, the inspector generals of the various agencies, the proliferation of uh, just questions about what this administration has been doing is just astounding. And this is another example of it. Violation of the Hatch Act, ethics laws. It seems like there are no rules with uh, this administration with deferring all of these investigations. Nick? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, part, part of the reasons, because as I talk to my friends in the either blue or red states, whatever you call them, that uh, are whether you were more Trump or Ed, here, here's their arguments. Um, and I'll, I'll start bringing them on IBM TV, but, but I'll listen to the other side. Their arguments is that we have too many rules anyway. In other words, uh, we're, we're kind of like an overregulated society. And with Biden, and this is the reason they're going to vote for Trump. Sorry, Biden is just more rules, more regulations, and frankly, bad for business. And I've actually seen that in my business. In other words, they pass rules, especially the guy who heads the um, Democrats so right now, Tom Perez. He passed rules that are just really draconian. Uh, they, they create a spur a lot of litigation with no sense at all as to how businesses actually operate. And and this is this this unfortunately if you're in business, you see time and time again. So as much as people say, well Trump is a moron, okay, or whatever they want to say about him. Okay, the fact is on business he I, he has rules. There's rules out there and they choose not to enforce them. If they did some of us in business would be spending all our time defending these crazy rules. One of them was the fiduciary rule. They, they put this through um, our, the retirement plans. And the real problem is fiduciary can be where you get to work, but not get paid. In other words, because you're going to choose the lowest base commission product out there. The lowest base, which I even know because I'm in the industry, you get paid nothing. So we asked, we had people ask Tom Perez, well, how can our people get paid? He says, oh, that's not my problem. They should go get a job somewhere else. I mean, to, to give you an idea how much they do not think about the average American that works out there, and I'm talking about the Democrats, they have no concept about a lot of people that work in small businesses and, com and um, commission-based businesses. All these people are going to throw their, their, their <laughs> votes to Trump. You, you know, regardless of what you think about Trump, because the thing is, he, he does not place these draconian rules on small businesses and and um, and the Hatch Act, in their opinion, just another one of them. OK, it's it's totally impractical. You're overseas. You're speaking. You're, you're, you want to speak something and you can't because what, you know, and 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 after a while, uh, I hate to say it, people just get bloody tired of it. Uh, they, now they believe Trump will win the election. See, I'm not of the belief that that's actually going to happen because of because uh, I do tend to listen to polls and I do tend to listen to the mess up that he did in, in the coronavirus. But at the same time, don't ignore these people. I mean, the thing is, they're, yeah, they're going to come out and they're going to vote. And they do have reasons to vote because I've seen it. Like I said, uh, uh, there was a couple of insurance companies that literally pulled out of the pension market altogether because they go, they're creating a rule that will just create litigation. It will not solve the problem. And when you try to be reasonable with these people, they're totally not reasonable. And that message is going to is throughout the entire, what do you call it? Is it red states that are conservative or? Yeah, red. red. Okay, it's through the whole whole, whole red state uh, industry. So he's going he's gonna to get his support. We don't care really what the people think in California. And yeah, um, Nick, 
Nick, but yeah. what, you know, are you saying that you should, as a, as a small business, you should be able to dump toxic waste into the rivers? No, no. The thing is, no, no one, no one oh. said that. Oh. No, 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 no one said that. So there that, should that. be regulation. Okay, see, 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 see there's, there should be regulation, but the thing is, there's a lot of what they call unreasonable regulation. No Correct. Over regulation. So say it that way. And yeah. uh, then, I, yeah. then I would agree. Yeah, you're right, you're right. In other words, the thing, well, see, Jim, this is one of the real problems we have with American politics in general. Okay, there's this far right and far left yes. that tend to control the conversation in the middle ground. If you're middle ground and you're reasonable, because um, here's what happens. You get thrown away by your own party. You know, in other words, the thing is, in, in this country, like I said, look, I'm a Democrat, but I'm against abortion. Oh, then you can't be a Democrat. They throw me out. I'm going like, right. What the heck's going on here? Okay, I just have one view that doesn't have to support your view, and yeah, all of a sudden I'm a bad guy. Dumb, dumb ridiculous! Guy. They're absurd. You're absolutely yeah. right. Well, and, well, and, the, and you know where where all the middle guys go? Um, they end up usually in the trash can. And and they're and Biden, by the way, is really a middle ground guy. And yeah. what they're trying to what they're trying to do is make this guy a leftist. He ain't no leftist. I mean, no. come on. You had a guest on that said <laughs> Biden AOC. And I just, I had to leave the show. No, he's, he's not even close. But see, this this is what, what, what goes on in this country is they try to push everybody to the extreme position. But yeah. but see, you're, you're right. I mean, if like what happened in Flint, Michigan was an abomination. I mean, are you kidding me? Polluting the water and getting lead and all these kids belly. I mean, who was thinking? Now, the other problem with government, as we well know, most of your work is making sure that the the railroads run and making sure that the infrastructure works. Yeah, well, that's know? what it's supposed to be, Nick. You know, yeah. before. that's what it's supposed to be, but you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm listening. I just had to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, the, and, and the middle guys like uh, John Kasich, Kasich, whatever his name oh, is, from. Yeah. They, 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 throw, they throw this guy out the door. I'm going like, you know, why why do we take our, our people that are rational, middle ground people, we toss them aside and you bring in the the fringe, the fringes of the conversations in, in America. 2016, if they had nominated Kasich, this country yeah. would be far, far better off. Of course, yeah. You're right, because, you know, Jim, in 2016, it had John Kasich, the former governor of Ohio. Yeah. I think that the uh, United States definitely would have, you know, moved. Some Democrats would have right. moved to John. Not yeah. that agreed with everything he does, but they would have been like, okay. He's, he's reasonable. Yeah. yeah, he's reasonable. That's, that's what I'm saying. But see, the real problem today. Oh, but here's the other thing is that goes on, Bill. Everything is moved toward a middle school, sophomore yep. type of conversation. In other words, they got to say something cute, you know, and and something you would say in middle school. And it just attracts people for some reason. In other words, if you make some middle school comment, I, I forgot the one that they were doing. Uh, today, they, they, that somebody made a middle school comment about, um, you know, uh, Joe Biden, and that he's part of the swamp. Oh, he was the these... Loch Ness monster. Oh, the Loch Ness monster. Okay, there, there you go. Okay, let's let's get let's get real. All right, the Loch Ness monster comment attracts people with middle school education, and it hangs over everything. And the thing is, one thing Trump is masterful is bring things down to the average or below average person, and they just hang on those words like Loch Ness monster. Okay, so so that stuff is what we see over here. Now I'm very curious as to how politics take place in places like India and Australia because we get nothing over over there. Like in Australia, I don't know if you have two parties, five parties, you have no parties because we don't get much information. Willie, on yeah. Australia. I don't even know who your bloody prime minister is. Do you know who the, the or do you have a prime minister? He, Jim, do you know yeah. who the prime minister is of Australia? Jim? Of course I do. Who is it? <laughs> he goes, he goes, he goes. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll go to Bill because Bill's our political pundit. Who's the prime minister of Australia? Uh, I'm not sure, although what I can <laughs> offer this is that uh, I know that there was recently uh, a dispute it, with your elections, and I believe it was a uh, one of the areas uh, I, I was watching, I couldn't quite understand it because I uh, just don't know your system. But Willie, please, well, Willie, who's who's the prime minister of Australia? And tell Scott us, Morrison. And tell us about Scott. your. I knew that. Who? Scott who? Scott, Scott Morrison. Oh really? Okay, and you're doing is a pretty he, good job. You're, okay, you're, you're you got you're one for one on our panel. Okay, now um, 
Is he a Republican or Democrat? He's liberal. 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 Okay, now does liberal mean the same thing over here that they're they're flaming? As Republican. Left, com, com, As Republican. When you As say what? So Republican. I'm sorry. So liberal, liberal is a Republican. Republican. Yes. I mean, that's the conservative party. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. And labor, labor is the other side. We okay, so you, so you have, have liberal and labor, and liberals and are conservative, and labor is liberal. Labor, uh, labor is like for all the workers. Oh, okay, so labor is for the workers, and yes. liberal is for the for upper class. Business owners, yes. Okay, all right. Okay, so it's a little oh. different over there. Wow, and, and are there only the two greens. parties? Then we have the greens. The greens. The greens. What's a green? Yes. Green is all the greenies. Don't cut the forest. Economy. Uh, uh, oh, oh, don't don't cut the forest. Okay. Well, you guys don't have forest over there anyway. I flew over that <laughs> outback, dude. All it is is desert. No, you know, there I, are no forests to cut. A significant problem with uh, the burning uh, with the fires. I believe last season, didn't they, uh, Willie? Yes, yes, they had a really bad fire, and yeah. then we have independents who run on their own. So you have uh, four parties. Uh, yeah. Oh, really? And that's wow. depending on what state you're in. Uh, yes. If you're up in Queensland, you have the nationals. Uh, nationals are um, anybody that's local that's not uh, labor. Yeah. Now, now I also heard that the queen, and I know Ben has left us, the queen <laughs> of England still has control over Australia laws. Is that true? Uh, we have, uh, like, governor generals. That's a representative of the Queen here. Wow. Okay. So you really didn't get rid of the, the, the Great Britain people? I'm not too switched on about that, whether we have we are still affiliated or we're not. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, uh, actually, if, if I might, uh, Nick, uh, before, obviously, we had the United States, we had um, the Confederation of States, the precursor to the uh, Constitution. Yeah. And when, just uh, historically, when Britain, uh, if Ben was here, I'd, I'd love to say this, when his empire was crumbling, uh, they switched over from the United States to uh, a, confeder or a, a confederation of right. countries. And that's how, that's the relationship of Australia to the UK. So the Queen, you're right, is still there. That's yeah, and, and, and from what I understand in US law, uh, I read this a long time ago, I don't know if it's still true today, that if you cannot find precedents in the United States, then you look at the precedents of Great Britain. Did you see the same thing, uh, yeah. Bill? Right, yeah. okay, so the thing is, it's really weird we still look at Great Britain as being- Common law. Great Britain. Now, in India, Ann Kit, what sort of parties do you have? Do you have two parties, four parties, no parties? Yeah. We party all day here. <laughs> yes, so there is no two party, the multiple parties. But uh, if you talk about national parties, so we have few national parties who decides uh, uh, the prime minister candidate. But uh, it's always, uh, I mean, uh, depends on uh, the balancing of act because some parties support some parties as well, uh, based on the numbers we have uh, during the election. So it's it's uh, basically a multi-party system in India, and uh, all the parties believe in democracy. But uh, but it all depends. I mean, the the parties who are nationalists, their parties who uh, preferred, like uh, Vinny said, about uh, Green Jones and all those stuff. Some parties uh, discuss about uh, ease of doing business and uh, they wanted to create some kind of a friendly business atmosphere. So it all depends. Everyone has their own agenda. And uh, that's how we live in it. And uh, I mean, uh, and uh, when we have uh, when we have multi party system and uh, when we have elections around the corner, we sometimes discuss about like uh, 15, 20 candidates uh, for the prime minister, uh, uh, I mean, uh, chair. And then uh, gradually we'll come out to be like five people who are there and then. Still, we have uh, an underdog uh, who become a PM. So that that happened a lot of time in India. Well, how how do you manage 1.3 billion people? I mean, uh, yeah. I think think Bill was talking about Montana, but let's face it, Montana has a population of 800,000. That's not even a small suburb of New <laughs> Delhi. Okay, how do you guys um, handle your 1.3 billion we have, people? Uh, we have 1.3 billion people. Uh, we put uh, around 200 million people to manage all those uh, 1 billion people. So that's not <laughs> significant. And also, on top of that, uh, our federal government, they are one of the top employers uh, in India. So they employ a lot of people uh, on their uh, payroll. So I think it's not that difficult. It's just that uh, we have to uh, create a process and uh, try to develop our country, uh, I mean, uh, like a horizontal way so that uh, we are, uh, I mean, there is no rural, urban or things like that because it's a big country. 
if we talk about cities we have like uh, 500 cities and all those stuff so to make sure that everyone will get their own uh, i mean uh, things and uh, place and all those policies and all those stuff so that takes time in fact uh, one of the running uh, governments uh, which is the modi uh, narendra modi sri narendra modi our prime minister he is one of the popular guys in the world right now uh, one of the top uh, uh, leaders in the world and uh, he come up with a lot of policy then one of the policies is just to open a bank account so we have opened a lot of bank accounts uh, during this tenure bank account means a bank or some kind of a policy or some kind of a stimulus will go to the person directly rather than i will take that uh, money and uh, i mean put it in wills account so so these are small small things which we need to do because to manage 1.3 billion which is now close to 1.4 billion i mean we are 1.3 yet right now so you need to have a lot of uh, small small and medium policies but we are focusing on standardization so that whatever i am getting in delhi a person in the rural area will also get the same facility so that is what the focus is right now mm-hmm. okay. yeah so so what i hear you saying is that in the ele- at the election and you know nick is right i mean i i couldn't i couldn't understand how to manage an election of 1.4 could you imagine the mail in ballots with 1.4 billion people but no um so really uh, it ends up being a coalition government that, that you get yes. various parties together yeah. and then there okay. are, and that's true down in uh, with you willie isn't that right same thing yep 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 now and uk okay. but bill uh, the, the situation is that uh, i mean in india if suppose uh, your government uh, or your party is in power and uh, if you got like 34% of the vote that means you already get a lot of votes because the vote counted like 100% and almost like uh, average people voted uh, as per the uh, as per the uh, i mean uh, stats we have 65 to uh, 65% is the turnaround for uh, voting so out of 65 you get 34% of the vote and that's good enough uh, to be a uh, Uh, to be in the power and then uh, you why why we need coalition because they are very strong regional parties and those regional parties is supporting lot of government so suppose you are very strong in washington uh-huh. okay from washington you are supporting me as a as a as a candidate for uh, the president mm-hmm. so like i have lot of contacts with regional parties so there is coalition government so i am supporting them when uh, when there is a state election and they are supporting me when we have a national election oh i so see this is the second so so that's why we call this coalition government and also it's just about uh, see it's more about agenda and what is your target uh, audience in terms of what is your target uh, people want to you want to show for and that's how you uh, come up with the combination combination mm-hmm. now in india i have another question uh, ankit like we 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 have things called protest and riots and it seems to be a pretty popular way of uh handling issues over here in india do you guys have protest and riots do people protest and get millions of people have, around uh, riots is something which uh, which is like non violent and uh, i mean uh, it it all depends uh, how uh, i mean government tackle those thing but when you talk about protest or when you talk about talking to uh, or raising some uh, hands uh, for government or maybe some policy change and all those stuff that always happens in india and then we have a lot of dedicated slots or dedicated places where people come together and uh, and raise their voices so that that happens every uh, i mean that happens every day in india because it's a big country every co- corner there is some kind of a, a policy change or things like uh, protest and all those stuff going on but government uh, come up and talk to those people at uh, mutual uh, uh, i mean day or i mean just to understand what they want and how we can figure it out but now you know that i mean lot of uh, i mean people from the outside world they support uh, those uh, people who are protesting and uh, just change the game altogether and that that becomes uh, riot i mean Because, uh, uh, your Honor, Honor, I, I have an objection, Your Honor, and I know I'm going to be overruled, but um, it's not a protest and riots; it's protests and or riots. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a distinction because the thing is, the protests are illegal and the rioters are illegal. So the thing is that that um, I, I totally agree with you that um, it's protest and or riots. Yes, Bill. So, uh, and Ankit. you mean to say that uh the protest the historical tradition context of protest in india has normally been peaceful but that now there's been a bit of a change because outside influence has have come in and uh they are motivating and supporting various uh protests and that's changing how uh things are working in india is that what you're saying See, you know that uh, that's that that not only happen in India; it's happening around the world. I mean, when when we talk about uh, uh, what happened in US a couple of months back, uh, I mean, there was a the news that uh, there are a lot of uh, outside uh, power who are supporting and uh, creating that kind of uh, uh, I mean, kiosk in US uh, regarding the black uh, movement. So, 
so uh-huh. you, you never know because, uh, i mean how the conspiracy works but uh, the important point is that uh, we need to talk to those protesters because they are the part of our democratic world and uh, we have to solve those issues at uh, at the table uh, that should be rights will not uh, uh, help anyone else and uh, they destroy the world and they destroy the the uh, the system basically so uh, we all believe in uh, protest and government is also happy with protest i mean if you have to say something you can protest you can take because see if i want to do a protest i have to claim that i want to sit there at a particular place for 14 days oh so is that right? oh so, yeah. so you go and you get a permit and then you can yeah. protest so government yeah so government allow us to okay you can uh, sit there for 14 days or 20 days and you can raise your voices and then media covers all those things we have a press conference and then government uh, i mean definitely try to talk uh, create a committee and try to talk the, to the protesters what is the issue but you know that i mean whenever these kind of uh, things going on there's a thin line between protest and uh, something else and uh, we need to just maintain those uh, i mean think peacefully but our country is always with that i mean you know about gandhi and all those things we are following the same pattern it's just that world is changing people are coming and they have different views so uh, it's easy to it easy to spread uh, the virus that's what happened with corona in, in, in the corona case as well but it's difficult to spread the positive words and that's what happening so it's just a matter of time but i think uh, uh, it's more about uh, the nationalism and community and the how uh, if you are thinking about a country definitely you will you will work it out but if you're thinking about yourself then this is the problem that's mm-hmm. civilized and 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 how do you, how do you guys handle guns over there because like uh, australia i believe they have gun control and now the guns they took them all away in india does everybody own a gun like here i think the average person owns about two guns uh, we do- don't own guns in india i mean uh, there are people who are a part of uh, military uh, establishment and they might have guns because of the licensing and because of the work they do but some people uh, can apply for gun license but uh, those guns are the license have uh, some kind of protocol or policies which we have to follow and that's what it is i mean so there is no there is nothing called a gun shop okay you can go and buy a gun from there it's not oh, really like that. Okay, so it's not not like uh, everybody has a gun in India. Nope. Okay. Wow, that's weird. Hey, Willie, how how are you guys handle guns down there? Uh, guns mainly farmers have guns. Um, in, in a city, I don't think anybody in in a city owns guns. Um, I know there are gun clubs where you can go and like practice. Uh, I've never been to one, so I have no idea. But yeah. Then you have the underworld element, where that's the stock of the trade. <laughs> right, right. And the thing thing is, though, though uh, in India, do do the people feel threatened if they don't have a gun? In other words, that they lose their they could lose their democracy unless they had a gun, or feel threatened. There's always a bad element around uh, in each and every country, so that happens a lot of time. But uh, uh i mean uh, the uh, government and the police and uh, all those people who are a part of uh, maintaining the peace and uh, protecting the society they are uh, responsible for all those acts and they they take the necessary actions uh, whenever something happen but it's a part of the if we are 1.3 billion people uh, you know that uh, there are some elements who have some kind of a different mindset and they wanted to rule with the guns and all those stuff but we have a law and uh, the law is following uh, uh, the uh, practices and uh, taking care of those people so, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's just yeah. I mean, it would be an interesting conversation because we we only hear one voice over here relating to the Second Amendment. I got the Second Amendment up my rear every day, but but just like COVID nineteen, uh, we don't look outside the borders of the United States. When um, our friend Sharif came in from Malaysia, and I found out, well, Malaysia has. 125 cases on 32 million people and then you see vietnam you see um, japan you see all the pan-asian countries all of a sudden you say wait a minute uh, shouldn't we look internationally to see some of these solutions to our domestic problems okay but um but the thing is we we don't we tend tend to look domestically for our domestic problems and obviously we haven't solved it because i believe every day at least here in raleigh durham if you came here and get every day there's somebody getting killed with a gun every bloody day you know and if i was a foreigner coming in from a country that doesn't have that i would think that you would feel um like sort of are you kidding? yeah it's a little scary yeah. you know yeah right you know that's the funny thing because uh, i mean when, whenever we heard about a story uh, from uh, a u.s media that uh, there was a gun happened uh, or, or someone a student is having a gun in the premises of a college or school or we were like uh, 
I mean, we all were like scared what's happening because those students, uh, they are, I mean, so young and uh, they don't know how to track with it. And then someone just come out and uh, start firing. So that's something which is surprising. And whenever something happened, I have to call to my to my family and friends in US what's happening, is everyone safe or not? Because we are very concerned what's happening because this is not what happened in India. I mean, right. we can see that there are a lot of fights and all the stuff going on. In fact, uh, uh, we caught uh, an ISIS, uh, I mean, so-called ISIS terrorist a couple of days back in Delhi. But that is a, that's the job of a, a police and our, I mean, uh, our detectives and our people from the security background, they take care of it. But uh, when someone, a civilian fires a gun, that's amazingly, I mean, shocking and surprising and scary. And you remember, I still remember that day when uh, there was a gun uh, shot happened in New Zealand and it was live on Facebook and streaming and we were like, what's happening? It, it looks like a movie to uh, everyone that uh, someone just come with a, with a live cam and then he pushed out a lot of fires in the mosque and uh, killed a lot of people. So I don't know, I mean, uh, what happens, why they are doing it. But uh, right now, I think that person is in trial. Uh, Willie, do you have any story about that person? Because uh, we are getting a lot of news from uh, New Zealand right now. Yes, he's on trial at the moment, and but you know he's obviously unstable person. Yeah. Um, he's he's not the full quid because he's just sitting there and not saying anything. And uh, one of the things I'm really worried about COVID nineteen and the scenario that's happening is because we're in lockdown. Uh, the police now have drones that fly up above the houses, and with thermal imaging. They can see who's home, who's not home. Really? What I'm worried about is, you know, do, is that on a sunset clause, like come COVID, end of COVID-19, that, that ends? Mm -hmm. Or will, you know, post-COVID, we have uh, some street demonstration. You know, will that bring out and do facial recognition? I mean, you have the capability. You have drones yeah. that can fly through the crowd. And the next, it'll just, oh, let's just put facial recognition on that. Yeah, you know? yeah, it could be, it will never be a problem here, Willie, because we'll just take out our gun, we'll just shoot the bloody drone down. So we'll go bang, and the drone goes, ah, splat. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah. On, on that topic, I'll, I'll tell you one more thing. Uh, there is a lot of scam and uh, conflict theories going around in the, in the hotel industry that uh, whenever you check in, you never check out how many cameras they have inside the room. And they are right. just recording you. Maybe, maybe they're killing the privacy. So there's a lot of apps which will help you out to find out if there is any camera in the room. Because yeah. when you <laughs> see uh, the room is clean and you have all the amenities, and that's about it. But when you talk about 5G, that's what the challenge is all about. Because we are scared of a lot of things. And uh, suppose if government say that they are not doing facial recognition, that's fine, okay, acceptable. But how can you stop a private company to do to, to stop facial recognition? I mean, if I have my drone and if I want to do it, I, I can do it. I mean. I can place that uh, recognition at any of my uh, doors or anywhere, and then I can recognize who's coming and who's not. Right. So I think uh, it, it's difficult to, uh, I mean, uh, stop those things. But I think there should be some kind of regulations and policies according to, uh, I mean, uh, that uh, technology and stuff like that. Because if we have seen in China, it's all face recognition. I mean, government okay. is tracking you in each and every step, including including your car, how many, uh, from where you are driving to which side, and all those stuff. So they are tracking everything. And with 5G, it's very easy. I still remember I was in Seoul uh, airport last year, and then I was surprised to have uh, robots uh, serving a lot of stuff at the airport. And uh, and the speed was like one gigabyte per second. I was I was amazed to see the technology, but that can be used in a different manner altogether. And uh, we just have to make sure that how we can make sure how we can protect our data and ourselves. Because mm -hmm. digital, uh, you know what digital twins, uh, there's a concept called digital twins. So suppose I'm right now uh, talking on IBM TV, but my twin is uh, on somewhere else, uh, talking to someone else at the same point of time. So I can create multiple digital twins uh, using technology and using 5G, I, I can be at five different places at one point of time. So that's not difficult now. It's pretty easy. <laughs> that's pretty cool. I, actually, <laughs> actually, yeah, yes, Bill, you had a question or a comment? Well, no, actually, it was more of an observation. And uh, it was a two-part thing. I mean, first, uh, every crisis we have, and if, if we go back to 9-11, uh, we never thought airport security was going to be like this. But at post 9-11, uh, everybody said, okay, yes. And then uh, we've come to accept that. Uh, but Ankit, you're absolutely correct that uh, with 5G combined, and, and Willie, you as well, uh, they're doing certain things in response to COVID-19. But then the question becomes, is that going to continue when the pandemic uh, has subsided? And then what oh. happened in the process? What have we become 
uh, uh, accustomed to and or thought about. And on this point, I, I was watching an interview between uh, Brian Williams and Snowden, and he was talking about the capabilities of 5G and what uh, other people have termed essentially mission creep. That is, you start with the goal, a uh, laudable goal, uh, helping with the pandemic, you put in policies and people get used to it. And then when the uh, crisis is over, they maintain that and then they use it for other purposes. I'm wondering what uh, you guys think. I totally agree with you. Uh, I think there should be some kind of sunset clause, a sunset clause to say, okay, this is for this period of time. After that, we'll review it or we close it. But there's a voting system in place to kind of checks and balance on that. Because, like you said, it's a mission creep. Uh, come post-COVID, everything is back to normal, but this hasn't been receded, so it's still there. Right, and people have become used to it. Um, and, you know, Anke, you were talking about cameras everywhere. Uh, you know, uh, have people raised any kinds of objections? Because, you know, and let me just uh, take a moment. I personally, when I walk into uh, a building, um, I look up to see where, you know, the cameras are. And it's just an instinct. And for me, it's like, hey, you know, they don't have cameras here and they don't have cameras there and that's dangerous and such. But um, I couldn't imagine, I find that uncomfortable, but I couldn't imagine uh, being in a society, say like China, where there are cameras everywhere monitoring your movements or having a drone fly over to uh, check on me to see whether or not I'm in my house. So I'm, I'm opening it to you, uh, both of your re reflections on that. So, Bill, uh, it's very easy to track you, basically. So, you have a gadget which I can control using some applications. Also, you have a smart TV, which also have a camera. I can control that and I can pull it uh, whenever I want to. And when you when you run around and watch out the cameras, the cameras are not like the moving cameras. Now, we have small pin uh, kind of a camera, which is not visible. It's just a pin and uh, I can record and I can see you live uh, without any problem. And then on top of that, a lot of people having cameras on the glasses and all those stuff. So it's not, uh, it's not, uh, I mean, you can't tra track those cameras. I mean, th those are not traceable. You can just only track those cameras which are visible to your eye. And secondly, uh, and secondly, it's, uh, I mean, see, when we talk about uh, GDPR and policies and, uh, uh, I mean, privacy and all this stuff, I know that's a policy which is undergoing and people wanted to have this policy, but it's not uh, possible to control those things because if I want to have any data at, from sitting in Delhi, I can have data of the world at any point of time. I mean, there are a lot of applications, a lot of systems and all this stuff. I can use it. And also tell you one more thing. I mean, uh, right now we are on World Wide Web. There is another web called Dot Onions. You can check out and read about it. You'll be amazed about uh, reading it. What is Dot Onions? The, the dark web, you mean? The dark web, yeah. See, and actually, I mean, uh, and Willie, uh, I, I do want to go to you, but uh, I want to state my question now and then have you, and then have you guys reserve it. I frankly don't know anything about the dark web, and uh, I was curious about it. But then I heard that once you enter the dark web, you you're like automatically a suspect when it comes to uh, national security. And then all of a sudden, you know, everybody's looking at you, which is one of the reasons why I, I won't even try to get into the dark web. But if either of you could explain that uh, to our viewers, uh, I think that would be helpful because I, for one, don't know, and I'm really curious. But go ahead. So basically, Will, uh, it's all about dark web and uh, people who understand the dark web. You can read about dark web, but I have never entered it and I don't have plans to, to go into the dark web. But the idea is that uh, if suppose someone is on a dark web with a, a synonym uh, user, they have a power to change their IP address and location at uh, within like uh, 10 seconds. So right now you are in US, uh, but your IP says you are in Germany and you are working for Willy, which is in Australia, but Willy is not in Australia. Willy is in Singapore. And that gradually changes like every uh, split of a second. So it's difficult to track those people. And then also I've read about that a uh, uh, lot of our, uh, I mean, a uh, lo lot of the world, uh, I mean, policing and all those stuff, or especially AI policing, they are tracking those people and they put the website and dark web down. But they have those uh, technology to put that back up with a different name. And you know that Bitcoins, uh, they've started from dark web. That's what I read uh, earlier. So dark web was there always, I mean, uh, and a lot of people who are in the real world, they are a part of dark web as well. That's how dark web works, basically. But it's a small community with people who understand the dark web and who wanted to do something which is not legal in the in our society, in our world right now. So I think that, that is what... But you can read a lot about dark web online, but uh, 
I won't suggest anyone to go and check out uh, the hardware no, because I, I you know, that's just, I mean, it's easy to trace. And then uh, why, why would I want to be a part of uh, that culture? I just wanted to know what's happening because uh, that gives us the curiosity and also understand that how we can protect ourselves and our uh, right. our, uh, uh, our identity and all the stuff. Because in the digital world, uh, what I can do on on the current web is that I can create a profile with Bill President on Twitter and I can start tweeting. But no one knows that I'm not Bill President. I Bill is someone else. So it's True. easy to do that, but that is not a part of the art web. That is a part of my mindset that I wanted to create some kind of a digital impression of yours and then use your name to do something else. That's still happening. But dark web is uh, beyond uh, what uh, we can expect and what we can think of. Wow. And and Willie, because uh, when you go through your startups, uh, do you ever have an experience with the dark web or, or any of these? Mm, no, no, no. Tell us about uh, that. No, I, I, uh, there's just nothing to do with uh, dark web. Yeah. We just totally focus on the startup, totally focus on getting up there. I mean, that's taking on another risk, if you want to call it, mm -hmm. that I'm not, that one, I can't handle and I know nothing about. And, you know, it's like getting into something like a headless chook. I have no idea what it, what it is or what it entails or what it covers. Right. So I just totally refrain from going there. Mm, mm, mm. Right. So uh, if, if, we, if we could pivot for a second, because I, I had a lingering question from before, and it, it's for Willie. Um, the process of bonding with your uh, clients as you take them through the startup process after the ice bath and after the, the bungee yep. jump, uh, yep. tell us about the rest of that process and how you work that with your... No, it's a 90-day uh Okay. induction period 90 days so what we do in that 90 days is we go for long walks in silence it's to build resilience yeah. i'm looking at building resilience in the startup because in the startup space you fall down stand up fall down stand up so what we do in that 90 days is take you through as much of that okay so the ice path is part of that ice path you don't have any control of the elements like you don't have control of the elements within your startup, okay? And you're breathing for air, you're gasping for air, and then bang, you get a hand that pulls you out. And I'm, I'm, and you do that, you know, constantly. So within the 90 days, I'm looking at doing three or four ice baths, you know, so that bang, you do it, get up, fall down, get up, fall down, get up, so that you go through that process and you build inner resilience. So come post accelerator where you out and you're doing building your startup and you got through and you got customers you can always refer back to your accelerator days how did i cope with this you know call back some uh, back at the accelerator you know just give me some pointers on how to do this at that stage we just give you pointers you have all the resilience to pull yourself out of the situation uh -huh. whereas when you're in the accelerator, you don't have the resilience yet. So that's what we're trying to build, you know, or bond with you so that um, you you have, you develop the skills that you can do it yourself. But sometimes you can have the skills, but not the actual uh, finesse of the mentor telling you, okay, this is how you do it in outside of the accelerator space. This is how you do this. Uh, just watch out for these things. These things can blind you. One of the things that's, that I came across just recently, it's from one of the guys from Israel, startup in Israel, and he's talking about uh, government involvement in startup. He said, we have seen in like countries like Sweden and Finland and Norway where government helps the startup a lot. But he said that that's been counterintuitive. It has not helped the startup because when things go wrong, the startup tells the government, oh, can you help me out? You know, the, he, he's not struggling on its own. Uh, that's why we're building resilience. There's no resilience in the startup from Sweden because he didn't need to have it because anytime he got stuck, the government helped him out. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. See, the, and there's no, and with that, there's no resilience. You know? Okay. So if things like, so one day he gets like 2,000 clients, what does he do? You know? He, he struggles, falls flat on the face. 2,000 clients is a good thing, but to be able to manage the 2,000 clients is where he's going to fall flat on his face. 
And I, I didn't know about that until the guy from his startup Israel was telling me about all these other things that can happen, that mm -hmm. can blindside you in this space. And I said, okay, when we do startups, we need to build um, resilience or embed resilience into the startup process. Because the st I, I'm looking at that as a transformation of the person, you know, get them up to a level. Wow. Hey, hey. Hi, Lynn. Uh, How are you? Like really fine. How are you? Lynn Shepard on uh, IPTV discussion on startups uh, Wednesday. And Lynn uh, runs multiple businesses. And uh, Lynn also understands that how we can start the business and how we can sustain it using our resilience and a lot of other uh, spiritual power to make sure that we consistently grow and grow for the best. Uh, Lynn, over to you. Share some experiences and then we'll talk about dollar store. Well, um... I guess the best thing you can do when you're doing a startup is remember that you only succeed if you have customers. And, and the second thing you need to do is to make sure you service those customers because without customers, you don't have a business. And unfortunately, I've been involved in some businesses where some people um, didn't seem to understand that concept and the businesses aren't, uh, aren't uh, in existence anymore. It was for them... It was a business I sold uh, back in the, the uh, late 90s, uh, and the second generation owner basically didn't understand that if you don't have customers, you don't have a business, and they quickly destroyed the business. So um, anyway, it is what it is, um, but so, so my advice to uh, entrepreneurs is make sure that you pay attention to your customers. Customers are number one. That's wonderful. And also, uh, Lynn, uh, we also want to like to talk about how you plan to uh, uh, invest in a business which is already running. What kind of factors you uh, look into before investing in a business? Well, it's interesting. <laughs> I, 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 I wish I'd. Uh, um, I, I was in Atlanta listening to uh, somebody speak, uh, and that was after I lost a business and lost over three million dollars, um, and. Um, and I'm sitting there listening to uh, to the fellow speak, and it was a, a big audience of people, maybe six or seven hundred people. And I thought, and and I happened to have gotten to know him pretty well since then. Uh, his name is Rob, but I, I thought Rob was speaking directly to me um, because when I started a telecom business in 2002, I did everything backwards. I assumed the business would would succeed. And what you need to do when you look to start a business, and I'm sure Willie knows this really well, is you wouldn't be looking at the business if you didn't think it was going to succeed. You just wouldn't. But what you have to do is to understand why it won't succeed or might not succeed and then make your decision. Look at Willie's head go up and down because, because I know. And we've all made the mistake. You probably have made the same mistake I made. Um, I, the other piece of advice I love to give to entrepreneurs is this, make sure when you have a business failure, because you will make sure it's the first one, not the last one. <laughs> so, 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 so anyway, um, but, but the, the truth is what Rob said was absolutely right that day. Uh, I got involved in a telecom business and even though it had a chance and it came, it really came very close to being a hundred million dollar business, okay? But it failed, okay? Why did it fail? Because I didn't understand the telecom companies, okay? I didn't understand how AT&T very specifically made decisions and other companies made decisions. I'd always had small businesses and dealt with small businesses. So, so we respond quickly in small businesses. Willie knows that too. But large corporations, I, I, when, when I got out of graduate school, I went to work for U.S. Steel for a year. And I used to call them a ponderous pachyderm because when you kick them in the rear end, the nose would jiggle three years later. And, and um, they just couldn't make decisions fast. Well, um, what, what happened with AT&T was we were part of a, um, uh, of a 50, 60, maybe $70 billion broadband program. Um, the president of the Southwest Bill, Bell said to us, we love your product. You can save us 
15,000 a location, and they had 80,000 locations. Go get your calculator out because I know you've got to figure that one out. Okay. But, Give me but, a minute. But, but anyway, even if we couldn't have served uh, all 80,000 locations, we clearly could have done at least half of what they had. We could have saved them $600 million. But you know what? In a, in, a, in, a, in a large rollout like that, they treated us like we were the pimple on the rear end of an elephant. They didn't particularly care. And so they spend the extra $600 million. It really didn't make any difference to them. Um, and, and, and in terms of all the aspects of what we could have saved them, and the president of Southwest Bell knew, and the president of Pac Bell knew, but corporate in San Antonio said, no, 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 we just, we just don't want to deal with them. They're too small. Um, we'll, we'll spend the 600 million. And it got a lot of people upset because everyone in their field said the deployment of our product was the smartest thing they could have done. But corporations don't make decisions that way. And I'm sure, Willie, you know that, especially large corporations. Um, um, oftentimes, they'll make deals with friends and other large corporations and, um, and basically, okay, you handle this for me. And then the other large corporation, which, and this happened to us, looks and says, okay, well, you're going to do it our way. Um, we had intellectual property. They wanted us to give them their intellectual property that we'd spent a couple million dollars on. And any new intellectual property we developed, they, they said they would own, we wouldn't, and they would restrict us to our profit. And, you know, we just couldn't do business that way. And we said, thank you, but no, thank you. We're out of here. Um, so, so I learned one heck of a lesson by not understanding the industry like I should have when I got involved. Um, and so, so the biggest piece of advice is do your homework properly and don't think about why it's going to succeed. Think about what may, might cause it not to succeed because that's the, that's the biggest thing, biggest hurdle you're going to have to overcome. So, Willie, what do you think? Totally agree with you. And everybody thinks that if you just throw money at startups, it will succeed. No, you still got to market the startup. You know, this people need still need to know where the startup is, what its story, what's the message, what problem it's fixing. So, and that's the part that, you know, a lot of people think, oh, that startup's there, so I'm going to throw two million at it. Two million is not going to cut it. It's like a dip in the pond. It, you know? No, it, re it really isn't. Ultimately, <laughs> With, with investors, um, we lost in the business uh, probably over $7 million, um, and that couldn't, that, that couldn't make it go. Because, because I mean, an, another thing, a lot of large corporations do their budgets. They have them finished by um, here by November. I presume it's, it's done on a calendar year basis in Australia. And if you're not in their budget, then they're not going to spend money with you for another year. Um, and you have to survive through that year period, which is the second thing I didn't understand about how large corporations work. Um, and you might get bits and crumbs and stuff like that. But, um, but I'll tell you what, um, that's a mistake. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's almost an hour, and uh, I would like to introduce our panelists uh, one more time. Uh, so we have uh, Bill Topperman joining us from Washington, D.C. Bill is the writer of correspondent and... Uh, Bill reads the news in the morning uh, every day at around 10 o'clock uh, on the United TV. We have Billy Hill joining us from uh, down under Australia, and uh, Billy is uh, heavily into startups. And uh, we are trying to work out uh, a new reality show produced from Australia about startups and the business world. We have our sponsor, Lynn Shepard, uh, talking about Family Dollar Dollar Store. And uh, Bill is having uh, amazing experiences, and uh, he's one of the legends in the business right now. That's what we call him. And he's running like seven, ten businesses right now at the moment. So. A lot of things we can learn from Billy, uh, Lynn Shepard, uh, based out of Philadelphia. And we have our friend from uh, Baltimore, a friend from Maryland, uh, Ketul Shah. He's our uh, expert in the payment industry. And uh, there's also uh, 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 an upcoming industry, FinTech. Uh, a lot of people doesn't know about it, but it's one of the biggest industry in the uh, in the current uh, world market right now. And I think, uh, Ketul, any news from the payment industry? Uh, any uh, updates, anything? 
Um, so yeah, there is like a uh, few things. I was in seminar with like, you know, first data, everyone's here about the first data, uh, yeah. Pfizer and the company. So I was uh, in touch with them regarding how the curbside pickup, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's pretty f uh, famous right now. Like everyone's wanted to have that solution. And the devices, like, you know, all the payment devices with the chip, uh, cellular chip capable. So uh, if, you, if you're if you familiar in the U.S. market, like, you know, if you go to any store, you see the pin pads sitting over yeah. there. It's uh, either the brands called Ingenico, uh, who's manufacturing all the devices, or Verifone and a few others, like, you know. And they all have... Uh, the latest devices are like more capable with the cellular chip. So you can insert like a, you know, your at and or T-Mobile or any SIM card, which connects with the 4G LTE. And basically you can use that pin pad uh, outside the parking lot or like, you know, in the garage or in the uh, open lot where like, you know, they have a table set up or curbside rest pickup or, you know, majority like now that's what the, the trend is. So all the devices are coming up or like already came up with the cellular chip. And that is what uh, we have been talking, like how to market that. Uh, so technically, like, you know, the, all the transaction you have to send online, like you cannot like send offline anymore. So you have to have a strong internet connectivity. Wi-Fi, they have a lot of limitations because of like, you know, the uh, brick walls and like some in the some, some of the restaurants and stuff like that. So it's really hard for them to, have a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth Bluetooth capability. So now that is what the trend is. And uh, uh, like a lot of like big corporations, like uh, especially in the lodging world, like they are looking for more like an e-com or mobile wallet and stuff like that. So people can, you know, use a, a wallet and make uh, reservations and all. Because especially after the COVID, everything's like same slow and picking up like, you know, slowly. So they, they want a customer to, you know, have all these options available so they can, you know, uh, buy uh, stuff online, book reservations online through their phone, or like, you know, pick up food from any parking lot or anywhere else. So it's more like, it's a new normal, that's what we call. And that is what the trend is going on now. So that is what I have been in discussing with like few big corporations out here. Wonderful. And I think uh, LinkedIn needs to move to Sasha's show uh, starting at 1 o'clock uh, about modern investing with Sasha. And uh, Sasha, I think, would get a chance to invest a lot of people and uh, how they can uh, earn uh, from equity during the COVID situation. So, then uh, before you want to leave, uh, quickly about Dollar Store. Yep, very quickly. Um, our family owns an online dollar store. Uh, the link is family.dollarstore.com, but we make it really easy for you. Just go to ibm.tv. There's a there's a big round button. It's green. If you're not colorblind, uh, you can, you'll know that. If you're colorblind, it's big and round. Just click on it. It takes you right, right to the website. Um, we're here because we're supporting Money Masters PBS, which is the not-for-profit that owns IBM TV. We love the mission. The mission is basically to uh, reduce the gap and uh, uh, between poverty and financial sustain sustainability uh, to provide financial education resulting in financial fitness. Uh, on, we have 4,300 items on our store. Uh, if you sign up uh, as a customer between now and the end of the, of the month, um, we have a, a gift token program where whenever you sign up to become a customer, you automatically get $5 worth of gift tokens um, but if you sign up between now and the end of the month, you're going to get five dollars more, uh, and uh, you can use those to shop on on uh, the website. We have uh, free delivery for orders of twenty five dollars or more. Uh, lots of lots of really great products, really good quality products that we sell for a lot less than you're going to find over the counter. One example. A, a woman's uh, line remover for their face, um, something that none of the five of us here worry about, but women do. Um, we sell it for $4.99. Amazon sells the identical product, identical quantity for $67. And that's just an example. And they charge you shipping. 
And of course, if you order $25 from us, shipping's free right to your door. Um, through the end of the month of September, we're giving 100% of our profit to Money Masters PBS. Um, normally it's 50% 50, 50 but what we really want to do is support Money Masters and the mission. So we invite all of you to please um, uh, come become a customer and help us support Money Masters PBS. Uh, go on the website um, and if nothing else, join the club. This is the one that Kimberly started. It's the Minion Napkin Club um, and um, I just think it's a great club. So um, I'm not going to ever use mine because I don't want to use them. I, I want to just save them so, because if I use them, I'll be out of the club. Of course, then I have to buy more. <laughs> so, so there you go. There you go. Oh, just one other th one other thing for you. We we have a lot of CBD products. Okay, they're a lot less expensive. Okay, but here's one. It's an extreme patch. Um, I should have had this in 20, uh, 2002 when I started my telecom company because I would have worn it perpetually knowing the pain that I was going to ultimately experience when it went down the tubes in 2009. But Willie doesn't have to buy these because all of, all of his businesses are very successful. So there you go. Anyway. That's so well that's, said, uh, I think, uh, and uh, Willie uh, gets a lot of spiritual power while hugging the piece, which no one, uh, I mean, we don't follow the, that practice, but uh, Willie does that practice, and I think uh, it's getting good rewards for Willie. Willie, anything about the I, piece? And I shared it with my daughter. My daughter's having a lot of issues. My daughter's teaching in the outbacks, like in desert place and uh, so she's having a lot of difficulties and she's a lot of the people there are not supporting her so I said just go outside and look for the closest at least six foot tall tree and when you come home from work just put your hands on the tree because the tree is sort of the exact opposite of humans we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide the tree breathes in carbon dioxide and breathes yeah. out oxygen so that way we kind of balance each other out. So what I do is when I come home from work, I hold on to the tree and everything from work, I leave it on the tree. Mm. And then I walk so, uh, into the house. So believe while, while talking, I just got an idea that uh, why can't we have a QR code for all the trees? And also we can let uh, people to donate using a QR code, uh, using k technology for a particular tree so that uh, whatever donation we'll get, uh, that goes to the tree to make it uh, more... Uh, sustainable and uh, get all the requirements. Oh, we plant more trees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and Bill will know what I'm talking about here, but Willie brings new meaning to the term tree hugger. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what Wonderful. tree huggers are, Willie? To totally, totally. Okay, and when I, when I walk out of the house in the morning, I just go touch the tree. So whatever work things that I'm handling, I join back with the tree, and then I take it with me to work. And when I come home, I hang it back onto the tree. So when I'm in my house, I'm totally present in my house. Yes. So whoever's in my house, I totally engage with them. And really, I, I wasn't aware that there are a lot of advantages of hugging stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now I learned today that hugging trees also. I don't. <laughs> and, and, and it's getting popular because of COVID. You can't hug anyone else. So trees are the best option right now. Yes. Yep. <laughs> That's true. By the way, I have one thing for Lynn, like before he goes. Uh, next week or then after, I'll show you a product that I ordered from India. Uh, it's a mask with the designing stuff as we were talking last week. Okay. So I'll, I'll I'll show that on the you know on the session live. Okay. And, uh, that is what I think. Like you know, uh, we should have more products like that. So you know, because I I heard that forty three percent sales increase in Amazon uh, in last uh, three months. Really, especially all over the world, yeah. So Amazon yeah. India, Amazon yeah. US, Canada, yeah, yeah. forty-three percent sales. So as I as you mentioned, like you know, on your tagline that you know, stay home and order online. I think it's it's working big time now. It is, it is. Yeah, but one of the issues they have is their delivery time has as 
uh, gone out. So where they used to deliver maybe in, in three to four days, now sometimes their delivery time is two weeks or longer. And that's because their system is strained, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, but right at the moment, we still deliver, depends upon where you are, um, you know, to Jim Ead, who lives in the Socialist Republic of Northern California, he can get his in three days. Um, but Bill, who lives in D.C., you who live in Maryland, and I who live in Pennsylvania, it's going to take us um, uh, maybe five days to get our delivery. could be four. I've had it before. Um, but here's the good news. Even though we don't deliver in, in Australia and India, we are working on getting some stores there. But Willie and Willie, who already is in Inket, who already is, are both customers because you can give um, the gift tokens to, to people here in the United States to use. And everybody knows people here in the United States. Uh, we just ask you, please, don't send them to Jimmy because he's hoarding all of the gift tokens. And for the people, for the people who haven't seen Jim, he, he, see, see Bill, Jim is my straight man until he's not here. And then you are normally. Uh, more mm -hmm. too, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it is time to get on Sasha's show, unfortunately. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to take my leave. Kettle, I'm looking forward to seeing yours. I, you know, yeah. I'm just, you know, I just, uh, we the other thing we want Jim is to always wear his because we might end up getting some cure, sort of computer viruses and we don't want that either. So he <laughs> should be wearing his mask full time. So yeah, that's right. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. That, that is that going to be where the next uh, real estate ad real estate is going to be on the face mask. <laughs> they got ads on it. I, exactly. Exactly. Started, uh, the branding and all those trademarks. In fact, yeah. uh, lot, in fact, a lot of people have their own uh, ID as well. That uh, I mean, because it's difficult to identify that person, so they have a small ID which uh, tells them that who that person is. So they have all like uh, a, a all like a static QR code, you know, printed yes, on it. You can see like that. Hmm. You don't but need to. Uh, mask will be like a mobile cover because uh, everyone, whenever they buy a new mobile, they have to have that cover, uh, especially in India and around Asian countries. That's what mask is. I mean, you need to have your mask for future. You have to keep it as an accessory, and uh, and uh, I think there will be a lot of innovations coming up. I've seen a lot of masks where they are using a cloth, and then uh, while uh, on the lip, it's a uh, transparent, so they can see the person smiling and uh, expression and things like that. But rest, uh, everything is so. So there's a lot of innovation going around. And I'm sure, like Bill is aware, like you know, I saw on Republican convention this week, a lot of people wearing like Trump mask. Yes, you know, yeah. You know, the Trump. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a. It's it's like an advertisement, free advertisement with, yeah. you know, protection yeah. and everything like there fashion. Because they've had them with Black Lives Matter. Um, they've had yep. them in various uh, places. Uh, you know, it's it, it's interesting. Um, but you know, we'll go from there. But yes, it is. But Lynn, is. the Family Dollar Show uh, does sell masks uh, by the bundle, and uh, they are. A quality, uh, but uh, inexpensive. So, you know, but they they have no advertisement. You have to put stickers yeah. on. Them, <laughs> you know. Okay. So, Kidul, uh, so Kidul, uh, what do we have to discuss on the on the payment industry uh, today? I mean, is there anything uh, uh, change in the industry right now? Any policies change uh, because the world is changing and everyone is uh, shifting towards the payment? And I had a word with a lot of e-commerce companies in India. Uh, to have an international uh, person uh, or a or a user, they need to have another uh, payment gateway so that they can attract those international uh, payments. That's what I told you last time. But a lot of people are not aware about it. So we can do a special show on e-commerce and stuff like that and how uh, Indian companies can have multiple payment gateways. But uh, anything uh, from your end? Yeah, so uh, like, you know, I'm also like uh, looking for like more uh, uh, big uh, firms, like, you know, where I can like partner or not me, but like, you know, my company, so we can have, we can work with the local banks, you know, for, uh, you know, payment processing. So like, for example, like, let's say a small country like Ecuador, right, where they have like a lot of local banks around, like Bank of uh, uh, Multiva and few others like banks there. So, you know, uh, normally like what happened, like, you know, in the smaller countries, like where, like bank is itself, uh, 
you know configure the pin pad devices and you know give it out to the customers so that like you know they can control the whole payment pass and they don't have like normally they don't have any like a gateway kind of a businesses in between that like directly like you know transaction initiated from the device to the bank but then the customer only limited to that bank and if that bank is not there in other region then you know they have a problem like they have to partner with some other bank so like if you see like uh, a customer having like so many banks on their back end just to process the transaction in in certain areas or certain regions so what the gateway business is like you know they they can help those customers and have like a only one output from the customer point of view to the gateway and that the gateway connects with the different banks so that is what i'm in touch with like a lot of other countries like ecuador is in like process right now and uh, a few others in uh, europe there is a one big uh, client that we have uh, on the lodging it's a big uh, six six star resorts all over the world australia south africa uh, dubai uh, in atlantis and everywhere so we are talking with them to have a you know uh, a portal where they can like send all the transactions and then we can distribute to different country based on their need and their local uh, you know the merchant service provider so that is what is happening now and uh, that is what i'm basically opening like lot of doors for different uh, payment providers or different processors that basically partner with us and like you know have the customer solution for them so that is the trend as i said and we have a lot of uh, uh, cellular chip capable terminals in the market now especially after uh, apple bought that company in canada and now yeah. they are planning to uh, turn your iphone on the point of sale as a pos or pms so basically you have to you know put your phone on the dock and start collecting you know uh, customers money or you know on, on your store so basically after that uh, news everyone started having their you know devices are more capable of communicating all over the place so that is what the trend is going on now and i'm in touch with like lot of big corporation as i said to have a solution available soon and yeah and i would love to have like you know a uh, chat with other fintech folks if we have in like you know the next next week or yep. then after we can set up a time and we can have like more technical discussions and you know i i would love to explain or like a demo that like you know how things are normally works on the payment side so i can show like some slides where people can understand like what exactly like gateway do or what exactly the acquires do or the processors do so yeah i can, would love to do that katu can you tape that so i can host it on the startup uh, uh groups that are admin so just to, if you can tape it so record it so that you sure. can have a look at it here yeah, yeah I can. That, uh, on the basis of that, we can invite a lot of people uh, to our uh, yeah. show because what happened is that in India and in Australia, it's uh, it's not a good time for people to join us uh, live. Uh, it's, I mean, I so that that's what uh, the feedback I got is from uh, these two countries, yes. and most of the countries yeah. who are in the southern hemisphere. Uh, so yeah. countries who are in uh, like uh, US and UK, they are still uh, eager to join that time. But uh, we are looking for a fintech company who can be who can join you at your time so that we can have a discussion. Which is not happening because of the time schedule. But we are coming okay. with a new show, uh, which starts at uh, eight to ten. Business masters and startup masters and things like that. Maybe we can have the discussion at that point of time, Billy. And we can have yep. Australian startups yep. and uh, startups yep. from uh, different countries uh, joining us and discussing about that. Because we'll be starting with the uh, with our uh, with our first topic would be domain and how we can buy a domain using all this stuff. But yep. whenever we talk about anything technology or businesses, uh, payment is always a part of it. That's what we yeah, are doing. We need your uh, help or suggestions uh, because we are doing uh, two festivals next month. Uh, one is World Peace Day on IBM TV, uh, which is going on since like 24 years, and uh, we are uh, will be uh, streaming like from 24 different cities around the world, talking mm -hmm. about peace and all this stuff. So that's starting from uh, morning nine o'clock uh, till uh, evening seven o'clock. That's the plan for the day. And then we also coming up with a musical marathon, uh, 24 hours with all our musicians around the world. And we are doing it some kind of a charity uh, donation for them, so that we can collect some money for those musicians who won't be able to come to the uh, main uh, stream music because of a lot of other issues and logistics. So we need to raise some kind of a charity or things like that. How we can collect payment, which is easy and which is uh, easy for everyone around the world with just one QR code. So that's what sure. uh, we are looking. For. 
so i'll i'll definitely like i'll prepare uh, one presentation and as as uh, will will mention like you know i'll record myself like you know having like uh, explaining like what the payment industries and how yeah. how that work and also like in the uh, probably one slide talk about like you know what's going to be in the future like you know how the new uh, payment 2.0 is going to be so that i'll i'll share that you know as soon as i get a chance and i'll you know i'll take out some time this week to prepare that and probably share with you guys wonderful yep let's start cool so good, think, yeah, good. Uh, i think uh, should we wrap the show or we have something else yes. uh, to discuss really yeah now? Let, no let's we can wrap, wrap this yep let's wrap the show okay. Yep. Okay. Thanks for joining us. And uh, right now we are doing a show with Sasha, Modern Investing with Sasha, which is live right now. So if our viewers yep. would like to join, so please do that. Tomorrow we have an yep. amazing uh, lineup on podcast on Thursday, followed by a gamers den, which is at 1 p.m. EST. So do join us, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, see you tomorrow. And have a good one. It's time to wrap up, and have a great day. Thank you. And thank you. Bless. Uh, Thanks. Stay connected and uh, stay away from Corona. And time mm -hmm. to wrap up. Bye bye. Thank you.